Now, a congressional hearing on the acne drug Accutane. On Tuesday, the House Government Reform Committee heard testimony on whether there's a link between the drug and depression. Indiana Congressman Dan Burton leads this three-hour session. Good afternoon. A quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written opening statements be included in the record and without objection so order. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. We're here today to talk about the acne medication Accutane and concerns that the drug is linked to depression and suicide. Accutane was licensed by the Food and Drug Administration in 1982 as an oral prescription drug for the treatment of severe acne. Current recommendations indicate that the drug should only be used when a patient has not responded to other treatments, including antibiotics. During the course of our investigation, we were told by the dermatologist that while the drug has many severe side effects, that there is no other treatment available. However, we also learned that many individuals have been prescribed this drug for less severe forms of acne. I am attaching for the record an article outlining natural treatments for acne. The most well-known adverse effect attributed to acne is birth defects of the children born to women who take the drug during pregnancy. However, we'll focus today's hearing on the mental health issues. Did the Department of Health and Human Services fulfill its public safety obligation in making the public aware of the potential for depression and suicide related to this drug? A significant number of psychiatric events, mostly severe depression, have been reported through post-marketing surveillance. The FDA has received reports of 66 suicides and 1,373 psychiatric adverse events other than suicide related to acne or Accutane. During, according to Roche Pharmaceuticals, the manufacturer of Accutane, the number of domestic and foreign reports of serious adverse events in the post-marketing adverse events database for Accutane as of April 30th was 5,665. The largest percentage of these reports were psychiatric problems. Almost 19% of the adverse events reported to Roche were psychiatric. Also, the most recent periodic adverse drug event report for Accutane includes, for a 12-month period, over 750 new psychiatric adverse event reports, both foreign and domestic, including 200 that were coded as serious events, nine reports of suicide attempts, and six reports of suicides. Four questions arose during the course of this investigation. When did the issue of depression and suicide first arise regarding Accutane? What actions did Roche and the FDA take to determine if there was a causal link? When and how was the public notified? And fourth, was the public notification adequate? According to Roche, there is no evidence of increased risk of depression or suicide related to Accutane. Instead, they believe that the events reflect the multiple risk factors in the population of adolescents and young adults afflicted with the disfiguring disease of acne. While the package insert for the Accutane contains language that warns of depression and suicide, this information is not typically provided to patients by either the physician or the pharmacist. Extensive patient education is required regarding pregnancy prevention while on Accutane because of the risk of birth defects. However, there is no system in place to educate patients and families about depression and potentially suicide. We learned through our investigation that reports of depression and suicide are not new. The first report of depression in patients taking Accutane occurred in September of 1982. Two patients in a clinical trial with 523 patients reported depression. Roche received five adverse experience reports of depression in 1983. November of 1983, Roche received his first report of attempted suicide. In November of 1984, Roche received his first report of suicide. In May of 1986, Roche received reports of five or six positive re-challenges in patients who experienced depression during Accutane therapy. In these patients, the depression went away when they stopped taking Accutane and began again after starting Accutane therapy over, over again. Positive re-challenge is a significant indicator of a causal link between a drug and the adverse event. 
As early as 1994, November of 1984, Roche began including information on the package insert about reports of depression. Even though, even though French authorities required a label change to include suicide attempt in March of 1997, the FDA did not require Roche to make a label change until February of 1998. FDA also required that Roche notify physicians who were likely to prescribe Accutane. In February of 1998, the FDA issued a talk paper advising consumers of and health care providers of new safety information regarding Accutane. And the paper stated as follows, quote, although the Accutane label already included information regarding depression as a possible adverse reaction, the agency felt health care providers and others needed additional information as a result of adverse events the agency has received. FDA and the drug manufacturer are strengthening this label warning even though it is difficult to identify the exact cause of these problems. Patients who reported depression also reported that the depression subsided when they stopped taking the drug and came back when they resumed taking it." End quote. What's disturbing to me is that the FDA published an article in their own consumer magazine entitled On the Teen Scene Acne Agony in July of 1999. 30% of the article focuses on Accutane. It goes into great detail about the pregnancy prevention because of birth defects, but it fails to make any mention of depression and suicide. This article appeared 16 months after FDA's advisory. Why did the FDA not use its own consumer magazine to notify the public of this concern? Today we're going to hear from three families. Amanda Callis was prescribed Accutane as a 14-year-old in September of 1997. By November, she was seriously depressed and attempted suicide. The psychiatrist treating her for depression was not aware of the connection between Accutane and depression and did not suspend her use of the drug after her suicide attempt. She remained seriously depressed. In February of 1998, Amanda's mother, Lori, learned of the FDA's warning and stopped Amanda's treatment. Amanda quickly made a full recovery. Mother and daughter are here today to share their experience. Stacy and Mike Bauman of Mundelein, Illinois, lost their son, Daniel, to suicide in December of 1999. Daniel began Accutane treatment in July of 1999. He suffered many adverse effects, chapped lips, dry skin, and itching joint and muscle pain, headaches, nausea, loss of appetite, mood swings, and insomnia. The physician thought this depression was school-related and never mentioned the FDA warning. Mr. Charles Jackson of Lubbock, Texas, lost his 17-year-old son, Clay, in January of 2000. Clay had been on Accutane for about three months. The family was provided no information by the physician regarding the FDA warning. And of course, we have one of our colleagues in the Congress who lost his son, uh, Bar Stupak's son, was lost uh, uh, to suicide not too long ago, and he believes it was Accutane related as well. Accutane is only supposed to be prescribed for severe recalcitrant nodular acne after every other treatment option has failed. Dr. David Pariser of Norfolk, Virginia, will be testifying on behalf of the American Academy of Dermatology and providing an overview of the types of acne and when Accutane is recommended. Dr. Douglas Jacobs, on faculty at Harvard and a Roche consultant, will present his evaluation of the adverse drug events regarding psychosis, depression, and suicide and Accutane. Dr. James O'Donnell, Assistant Professor of Pharmacology, Rush Medical School, will present information regarding the connection between Accutane and other vitamin A derivatives and depression and suicide. Dr. Jonka Bull will testify on behalf of the FDA. I realize that this issue will be difficult for some of you to discuss, and to those families who have lost loved ones because of this or because we believe that's what caused it, our heart goes out to each and every one of you. And I know it's going to be a difficult time for you today, and, and we really appreciate your being here. I do hope that this hearing can help resolve some of the unanswered questions so that these tragedies will be avoided in the future. The hearing record will remain open until December the 18th, and now I'm happy to recognize my colleague from California, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing addresses an issue of great importance, and I want to begin by commending the work Congressman Bart Stupak in this area, his tireless efforts to raise public awareness about the 
risks of Accutane have, I'm sure, already helped many families. His efforts have also been instrumental in encouraging Hoffman LaRoche and FDA to do more to learn about the risks of Accutane and to inform patients and families about those risks. Accutane is a powerful and effective drug for the treatment of severe recalcitrant acne. For many acne sufferers, it is the only drug that can cure them of an otherwise scarring disease. Because of this drug's benefits, it is imperative that we understand all of its risks and fully inform patients and their families. We already know a great deal about Accutane's risk of severe birth defects. That knowledge has provided the basis for patient education targeting women of childbearing age. But the same is not true of the risk of psychiatric disorders, and that must be changed. I'm troubled by how little we know about the link between Accutane and psychiatric disorders. No study has proven conclusively that Accutane causes psychiatric disorders, but a great deal of evidence suggests that there may be a link. A recent FDA analysis of voluntary reports, so-called adverse e event reports, found that 147 cases of suicide and hospitalized depression have been associated with Accutane since it was first introduced in 1982. Even more disturbing, evidence shows that many patients feel depressed while taking Accutane, stop feeling depressed after treatment ceases, and then feel depressed again if tra treatment is resumed. Officials at FDA state that such cases, quote, provide the best evidence to support a relationship between Accutane and psychiatric disorders. But this is not conclusive proof, and it is unacceptable that such an important question has gone, gone unanswered for so long. I'm also troubled by the lack of information provided to patients and their families. As we will hear today, and as was the case for Congressman Stupak, many families are completely unaware that depression and suicide have been associated with Accutane. While the risk of depression has been a part of the label since 1985, the risk of suicide was not added to the label until 1998, and patients and their families simply did not have reliable and valuable access to this information until Hoffman LaRoche changed the Accutane box in only May of this year. But this new warning is still not reaching all users because many old boxes without the warning remain in circulation. With a risk as detrimental and tragic as suicide, it is unacceptable that patients, including many minors, and their families are not informed about it. A box warning is insufficient. Until a pamphlet specifically geared for patients is issued under the MedGuide program, they will not be fully informed. I am heartened by some positive developments. Hoffman LaRoche has agreed to work with FDA on a patient informed consent form and a MedGuide pamphlet to warn of the risk of psychiatric disorders. Both will clearly discuss the risk of depression and suicide and will do a great deal to inform patients and their families of these grave risks. I call on FDA and Roche to implement the MedGuide and patient consent forms quickly. Most important of all, Roche has finally agreed to fund research into the link between Accutane and psychiatric disorders. Roche will be working with both NIH and FDA on the design of this research. I want to emphasize that this research must be independent, comprehensive, and extensive enough to answer the very serious questions about the psychiatric risks of this drug. This research is crucial and long overdue. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and to exploring how to improve the information and understanding about Accutane. And uh, Mr. Chairman, should there be further hearings on this subject, uh, I would like to work with you. I think we ought to hear from uh, the Hoffman LaRoche company representatives uh, themselves, because there are questions that I think uh, they ought to answer. But I'm pleased you're called this hearing. I think you have uh, 
important witnesses that can help us understand the problem and give us a good uh, guide as to what, what public policy recommendations we need to make as uh, representatives of the people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, Ms. Morella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly, I want to thank you for holding this uh, uh, hearing uh, on this issue. There's nothing that we can do in this committee that's more important than ensuring that the medication given to individuals, particularly children, is safe and effective. I can't imagine any pain that is more grievous than finding that the medication prescribed to your child or family member actually caused them significant pain or in some instances even led to their death. Today's hearing will hopefully enlighten all of us on the uh, efficacy of Accutane, whether its side effects lead to depression and suicide. I know the witnesses that come before us will elucidate both the positive and the negative outcomes of Accutane. I do want to thank the first panel for their courage in coming before us. This drug, Accutane, which has helped thousands of individuals who had serious acne problems, uh, may also have dangerous psychological side effects. It's essential that we look at all facets of the issue before any decision is rendered. Preventing others from benefiting from Accutane without ample evidence to the contrary uh, could be considered uh, pernicious as continuing to pres just as continuing to prescribe the drug if we know it is dangerous. In the end, our objective today must be to ensure that all available information is passed on to families and patients about all possible side effects. I look forward to hearing the testimony today and then discerning an appropriate role for our committee. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Morella. Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a very important hearing. When you look at what seems to be an absolute flood of suicides in many of the high schools of America, I would hope someone in these two panels would tell us if there is any medical data as to whether Accutane has uh, resulted in uh, a type of uh, suicide that haven't been with other types of suicide. That's the question I'd like to know. What else besides Accutane? Thank you, Mr. Horn. Uh, we'll now turn to our witnesses. Uh, uh, would you all rise, please? Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the whole truth tonight about the truth stop you got? I do. do. Be seated. I think we'll start uh, with uh, right down here at the left hand, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Callis, and then we'll then have you and your daughter both make their statements. If you could try to confine your statements to five minutes, that'd be fine. If you go a little bit over, we'll be lenient, but we'd like for you to be as close to it as possible. Ms. Callis. Good morning. In August 1997, my 14-year-old daughter, Amanda, was a normal teenager. She liked Excuse me, would you, would you pull the mic a little bit closer to you so we make sure we pick it up? Thank you. In August 1997, my 14-year-old daughter, Amanda, was a normal teenager. She liked school and she made straight A's. She liked talking on the phone for hours. She had a new boyfriend and she liked life, but that quickly changed. On September 23, 1997, Amanda started taking the acne medication Accutane. She was excited about taking Accutane because the dermatologist said that the acne Amanda had been undergoing treatment for since the sixth grade would be cleared up. During the visit to the dermatologist, Amanda and her father, who accompanied her, were given an explanation about the physical side effects, a warning about pregnancy, and a pamphlet to read at home. So together, Amanda and I carefully read that pamphlet and the release form her father had signed. I remember the warning about pregnancy and the many physical side effects, but I do not remember seeing the word depression in that pamphlet. It definitely wasn't on the release form, and I know the word suicide was never mentioned anywhere. However, by November, Amanda had fallen into such a depression that she wanted to die. And on November 15th, my daughter took 40 pills in an attempt to kill herself, and she came within hours of succeeding. After her suicide attempt, we continued to follow the doctor's orders, only now psychiatrists and therapists were involved. On the advice of those doctors, we admitted her to an adolescent facility, and she started taking antidepressant medication, along with the Accutane. By the way, the Accutane was continued with a psychiatrist's approval. 
As Amanda's depression worsened, despite the therapy and medication, the only thing we could visibly see working was the Accutane. Her lips dried out, cracked and bled, her joints ached, and she was always thirsty. But the dermatologist told us that that was just the effect of Accutane. Nothing to be worried about. Just don't get pregnant. Finally, after three months of treatment in February 1998, even the psychiatrist could not understand why Amanda was getting worse. By now, she had lost 15 pounds. She slept through her classes. She never talked on the phone. She wouldn't take a bath. She cut her hands with razor blades, and she generally hated the world. And my daughter hated herself. And my husband and I watched our daughter die before our eyes. And now, even the expert was telling us they couldn't help Amanda, and they didn't understand why she was, half, she was so depressed. I cannot begin to describe the hopelessness and the terror we felt as parents. We didn't know how to help our own child, and we were trying. Then on February 26, 1998, I found out from a friend about the FDA's warning, uh, the FDA's warning about the possible depressive effects of Accutane. She happened to see it on television. You know, I never did see that information. I had to get a copy of the warning from the internet. As a matter of fact, I gave that information to both the psychiatrist and the dermatologist, because you see, they knew nothing about the new warning. I threw the pills away, and within days, I watched my daughter make a miraculous recovery. Within one month, her psychiatrist, who knew and had approved of Amanda taking Accutane all those months before, could not believe the change in my daughter. Thank God we've gotten our normal, at times aggravating, but definitely normal teenage daughter back. And yes, she still talks for hours on the phone. Amanda stopped taking the drug. But we've not stopped telling people about the effects of this drug, and I've not stopped hearing about the devastating effect it has on teenagers. We've done news articles in our local paper. We've appeared on news shows. We've done whatever it takes to get the word out. But should I have to do this? Is it my job to tell the world that this drug is dangerous and needs to be studied and controlled? I know that Roche Pharmaceuticals will tell you that Accutane does not affect teens, that teenagers are depressed anyway, especially teens with acne. After 16 years, of teaching teenagers every day, and I'm an English teacher, I can tell you that while teens' emotions are very volatile, very few are clinically depressed, and even fewer are suicidal. Shame on Roche for not giving our children a fair chance and just casually dismissing their lives as a trivial matter. It is time to find out the truth about this drug. Therefore, I demand that the FDA take action. The FDA must require Roche to produce their worldwide database of adverse psychiatric reactions to this drug. The FDA must hold Roche Pharmaceuticals accountable. The FDA almost, uh, must also require Roche to explain why the French learned about, the French changed their warning in March of 1998, but the FDA wasn't aware of the change until a year later. Claiming ignorance about the warning in France is not an excuse or an explanation. It's a cover-up, because you see, Roche's parent company is in Europe. Finally, I demand, ask, plead, and beg as a mother that the FDA require an independent study to be conducted on Accutane to look into and determine if and how Accutane in the United States and Roaccutane in the rest of the world causes depression. We need to see an unbiased study done to investigate this matter. I know that recently Roche issued a stronger warning label, but at this point, warning labels are not enough. Our children are dying because a drug company makes lots of money from this drug. This is the same company cited for once advertising that Accutane helped depression, this just one month after the FDA required the warning about suicide. Is the almighty dollar and corporate bottom line worth more than our children? We would never allow our children to play Russian roulette with a gun, but we allow that to happen every time a prescription for Accutane is given. If you do not act and act promptly, you've just pulled the trigger. I just hope it's not your child, and I hope and pray that the chamber of that gun isn't loaded. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Callis. Amanda, would you like to make a couple of comments? At some point in everyone's life, they are faced with the decision to grow up. Most of the time, this is not a conscious decision. It is just a natural part of life. Unfortunately, I didn't have that choice. At 14, I was forced to leave my childhood behind because of the monster under the bed, Accutane. The summer after my eighth grade year, I talked on the phone with my friends and boyfriend. I went to the movies and I planned for high school in the fall. I also worried a little bit about my face because although I had been undergoing treatment for acne for several years, 
my face and back were still broken out. But lately, the dermatologist had been talking about Accutane, so I knew that there was hope. Before I knew it, school was here, and high school was great. I joined some new clubs, I made the volleyball team, and I was elected freshman class reporter. This year was definitely turning into one of the best years of my life. And then on September 17th, my dermatologist prescribed Accutane for my face. We talked about the physical side effects of the drug, and she warned me about pregnancy. She then sent me home with a pamphlet to read. Of course, my appearance became worse before it got better. My lips chapped and bled, and my skin dried out. But my dermatologist and I had discussed all of these physical side effects of Accutane, so I didn't care because it just proved that the drug was working. My downfall started from the moment that I took the first pill. After two weeks, my happy mood began to slowly dissolve. I found myself feeling sad, and I often cried for no reason. I began to slack off from my schoolwork because I was just too tired to care about my grades. I frequently argued with my parents and friends. In fact, I often provoked arguments until I was in a screaming fit with the other person. In six short weeks, everything about the best year of my life had become non-existent. I just didn't care anymore, and on November 14, 1997, I took 40 pills and went to sleep, never expecting to wake up. However, at 3 o'clock that morning, I did wake up, and I was sick. My parents found me and took me to the hospital where my stomach was pumped. I was then taken to an adolescent facility where I stayed for a week under the care of a psychiatrist, and I began taking Prozac. However, even the Prozac didn't help. No matter how hard I tried to feel better and be normal, and believe me, I did try very hard, I just sank deeper into depression. I began to restrict my food and lost over 15 pounds. My grades dropped, and I went from being a 4.0 student to making C's and D's. I wanted to sleep all of the time. I hated myself more and more each day and began to cut my hands with razor blades. Ironically, the only good thing in my life was my clear skin because of the Accutane. During that time, I watched a monster live in my body and control my actions. I wanted to feel better and be happy, but I couldn't, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how much therapy I attended, and no matter how much medication I took, I was miserable. I had no control over my life. A monster was in charge. Fortunately, that changed at the end of February when my mom heard about the warnings for Accutane. Do you remember that little drug? It was going to help make this year the best year of my life, right? I had been taking it all along. I had even taken it at the adolescent center with the psychiatrist's approval. After that report, mom took me off of Accutane, and within two weeks, I began to feel normal again. I started eating and quit cutting myself. I began to study again and stayed awake in my classes. By the end of March, the Accutane was out of my system, and I was working hard to catch up, but I was in control. No monster in sight. By April, my psychiatrist released me from her care, saying that I had made a full recovery. All of my doctors agreed that they had never seen a turnaround like this, and my depression must surely have been caused by the Accutane. That year became a defining moment in my life when I was forced to grow up. I just find it sad that I was never given the chance to choose, to hold on to my innocence and keep my childhood for a little bit longer. I have had to pay the price and face the consequences for a choice that I didn't voluntarily make. I think the people who make Accutane should have to face the consequences for stolen innocence and lost lives because of the choices they make to hide the devastating effects of this drug. I know that Accutane causes depression, no matter what the so-called experts say. I have lived to tell my story. There were two girls that year, me and me on Accutane. Today, I am grateful just to be alive. I am a senior in high school and plan to go to college next year. I was lucky. I survived Accutane. But I will live with the memories of that year every time I gaze in the mirror. You must do something about this drug because so many people do not survive. You see, the monster under the bed is supposed to be imaginary not a pill you take to clear up your skin. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, Mr. Bauman. Can I take seven minutes? Sure. Thank you. And may I say that listening to Amanda for the first time, I can see exactly what happened to my son. It was the same thing. I'm coming to Washington today not in anger, but with some hope. 
I'm not angry at the school system system that called us in unexpectedly and with no previous communication to sit down in a small room in front of two administrators and three armed police officers to be told our son Dan was to come home, be homeschooled as a result of the Columbine tragedy simply because he wore black. They were afraid and I understand that. I am not angry at the dermatologist who diagnosed the cause of Daniel's acne as being stress related and even pinpointed the day of the meeting as its beginning, but then prescribed Accutane as an initial remedy rather than a last resort with no patient parent counseling as to the possible consequences. I am not sure if he was not aware or just thought that the risk was not worth mentioning in light of the great results that could be obtained. I'm not angry at the pharmacy that distributed this expensive drug for not counseling us in any way as to the potential side effects. I recently went to the same pharmacist for a prescription for antibiotics and he spent five minutes talking with me, including uh, talking to me about the side effects, which included nothing at that time more serious than possible stomach ache if not taken with a meal. I know he cares. I'm not angry with the company that labels the drug, even though the labeling did not include the dangerous potential side effect of suicide, although I'm not sure why it did not. I'm not angry with the drug company that makes Accutane because I believe that for many, it is a godsend. I am not angry at the therapist in Lincoln, Nebraska last Thanksgiving who when told that Dan had scored high on a suicide risk inventory test, elected to interview him over the phone from home and clear him from all risk. Dan committed suicide two weeks later. And mostly I'm not angry with myself or my wife Stacy for thinking that our son's behavior would just, was just that of a normal, healthy, independent thinking teenager who was going through a phase in life. I do not know if our dermatologist giving up his practice had anything to do with our son's death or not, but I do know he is now teaching at Loyola University. I can only hope that he teaches his students that the use of these drugs, even for dermatology, should not be taken lightly. I met a friend from high school not long ago in a Sam's Club. It turns out she was there to pick up a prescription for her son of Accutane. When I asked if she was aware of the potential risk, she looked at me like I was crazy. I asked if she was counseled by her dermatologist, who is different from ours. She said she was not. I asked her if this drug was prescribed when other remedies had failed and found out that it had been prescribed first before any other remedies had been tried. I then asked to look at the labeling and letter that came with her prescription and found that it made no mention of depression or suicide and the pharmacist, well, it made no mention of suicide for sure. And the pharmacist said nothing about these potential dangers to her. The pharmacy and the labeling company were both different than ours. I then tried to reiterate my concern and was dismissed with my son is very well liked, outgoing and happy, much like my Dan, as though nothing could happen to her son. I don't think hearing the potential risk from me meant anything to her. I believe that people do have the right to determine the amount of risk that they are willing to assume for themselves, but they do not have the right to impose that risk on others unbeknownst to them. I fly small airplanes for a living and occasionally take people from one place to another in bad weather. If there's a thunderstorm in my path, I let them know the possible consequences and that it will be safe, however, it may be very uncomfortable. Even if the situation changes, we may have to d divert and delay or possibly not be able to get to the intended destination. I believe the choice is theirs. And if I lose a few trips as a result, so be it. I have found that this drug can be very dangerous for pregnant women as associated with various birth defects. There's no circumstances under which it should be prescribed. According to the physician's desk reference, women should sign a form consenting they will not get pregnant when on, when on, while on Accutane. I've seen a television commercial which is animated, of kids sitting around a computer. Then the computer screen shows, is shown with a picture of a boy's face with dots on it, representing acne. The child at the computer presses a button and the dots disappear. Call Roche for more info. I don't think it's as easy as pressing a button on a computer getting rid of your acne. I saw a doctor on TV saying there's no link between this drug and suicide, but later found that the drug company itself funded his research. In my mind, this is a conflict of interest and at the very least gives the appearance of impropriety. In the PDR, Roche itself lists depression and suicide in bold, which means highlighted as possible adverse reactions. I believe that this is a powerful drug and have no doubt that it can clear up or at least improve even the most severe acne, which my son did have. 
I realize that the drug company is in the business to make money, and I am sure that a widely prescribed expensive drug like Accutane does just that, but my question would be at what cost? My suggestion is I do not necessarily think that this drug should be pulled from the market, but I think its distribution should be handled differently and additional research conducted by an independent source as to potential hazards. I wonder if my son's suicide was ever reported to the FDA and how many others there might be out there. Wouldn't it be okay if we let people know that there may be a danger and let them decide for themselves if it is an acceptable risk? If So what if the drug company makes a little less money? After all, I believe most people think that smoking is harmful, but many still do it, and the cigarette companies are still in business. None of us as individuals has the time or resources to fight for all the causes that are important in life. But if by coming here today we are able to find a stronger, more powerful voice to carry on this investigation and education, we've done our job. In conclusion, I would like to thank you for letting me come here and speak my piece. If sharing my experience helps even one person, the trip will have been worth it. And I believe that life should always be held with a higher regard than money. In fear, greed, and ignorance, all things that can be overcome with compassion, understanding, and education played a part in my son's death. Lastly, my greatest hope is that by coming here in some small way, my son's life will be given meaning and his death dignity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bauman. Mrs. Bauman. Daniel began Accutane therapy on June 25th, 1999, three days after his first visit to the dermatologist. On June 22nd, Daniel's dermatologist told us that the breakout was a result of high school stress and even pinpointed the week the stress may have begun. The dermatologist sent Daniel home with a prescription for prednisone, erythromycin, a shopping list that included Purpose Bar, Colloderm Fluid Gel, Pre-Sun Ultra Gel, and Vitamin B5. In addition, we received two brochures that we were to read before starting Accutane therapy. Important information concerning your treatment with Accutane and what young men need to know about acne and its treatment with Accutane. Daniel and I read both brochures and felt that it was something that we needed to do and was looking forward to the promising results. This was a very big decision for us considering we didn't have insurance and was going to be self-pay throughout the Accutane therapy, monthly dermatologist visits, and blood tests. It wasn't long before the side effects started, chapped lips, drying skin and itching, joint and muscle pains, headaches, nausea, loss of appetite, mood swings, and insomnia. This was a very difficult summer for Daniel. He didn't even want to leave the house anymore and just wanted to stay in his room all day. On the first day of school, Daniel cried as we were driving there. He was 15 at the time, going to be a sophomore. He didn't know why he was crying. He said he just felt weird. School was very difficult for Daniel this term, and he had a very hard time concentrating. Daniel and I went to the dermatologist every month, and we were told that this was all very normal and to be expected. He assured us that the mood swings were normal and would be going away as soon as the Accutane therapy ended. On December 11th, 1999, Daniel committed suicide. I called the dermatologist two days after Daniel's death away and talked to him directly and let him know what had happened and that we wouldn't be making our next appointment. He offered his deepest condolences. At the time of Daniel's death, we knew nothing about Accutane and its adverse reactions linked to depression and suicide. It wasn't until two months later, on February 9th, that I discovered that Accutane might have played a role in Daniel's suicide. I was having lunch with some friends and a concerned friend mentioned that she had heard that prednisone may be linked to depression and she knew Daniel was taking this for his acne. As soon as I came home that afternoon, I looked for Daniel's entire prescription receipts and started reading everything I could. I got online and used the two key words, Accutane and suicide, and found the FDA's MedWatch News dated February 26, 1998, important new safety information about Accutane. I was home alone at the time and just couldn't believe what I was hearing learning for the very first time. In addition, I also discovered that the brochures Daniel Dermatologist gave us were copyrighted in 1996 and 1997, respectively. The brochures had no adverse reactions reporting depression, psychosis, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, and suicide. I was finding it very hard to believe that Daniel's Dermatologist had no idea or updated information to hand out to his patients. 
I have since visited the pharmacy where Daniel's prescriptions were filled and asked the pharmacist if she knew any of the adverse reactions associated with Accutane. She was not aware of depression and suicide. She immediately grabbed a 40 milligram package from the shelf and was surprised to find out that the depression and suicide warning was not present on the packaging. I find it interesting that five months after Daniel's death, his dermatologist unexpectedly announces to his patients by the way of postcard that he was closing down his practice to teach at Loyola University. In addition to everything that continues to point that Accutane played a role in Daniel's suicide is a picture that I received from a friend on, on the day after Thanksgiving this year. Looking at this picture brought tears to my eyes. His beautiful smile of hopes, dreams, and promises had been taken away before, before Accutane therapy. I realized that we have pictures of Daniel before Accutane, all smiling, and pictures of Daniel on Accutane, no smiles. As you can imagine, this past year has been very painful for our family, and the more we research, the more we realize that somehow or another, our precious son's life fell through the cracks. I am not looking for an out. I do know this for a fact. The dermatologist provided us with outdated information. The pharmacist didn't provide any patient counseling. Renlar Systems and First Data Bank package insert did not include the most current adverse reaction, suicide. Roche's labeling did not include in the warning depression and rarely suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts, and suicide. The FDA has allowed Roche to continue to profit from this drug for far too long without taking any responsibility for the damage it continues to do to our children. Mistakes were made by many, and now we are all suffering because this could have all been prevented if everybody did their jobs. I hope that this limited information I have provided today will somehow make a positive difference in our children's future. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share Daniel's story with you. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, inviting me to come here and testify before this committee today. This is going to be extremely difficult for me to talk about. However, it's extremely important for me to be here. So we can just prevent just one parent from having to experience the pain and grief that my family has had to endure, then all of this will be worthwhile. On January the 13th of 2000, my 17-year-old son and my best friend, Clay, died from a self-inflicted gunshot in our home. Around 4 o'clock in the afternoon that day, imagine my wife and my 10-year-old son coming home to find his lifeless body dead in his bedroom. I will never be able to remove what they saw that day from their memory. This is going to stay with them for the rest of their lives. Clay began going to a dermatologist at the age of 14 for normal teenage acne. In October of 1999, at the age of 16, his treating physician decided to put Clay on Accutane for his mild acne. There was never any mention of suicide as a side effect. The information that Clay brought home from the dermatologist was a brochure dated 1994, made no mention of suicide. The only thing that concerned the dermatologist was our ability to pay for the drug. The package insert that came with the prescription made no mention of suicide as a side effect. The pharmacist, where we had all of Clay's prescriptions filled, never mentioned suicide as a side effect. The first time that we were ever made aware of any relationship between Accutane and suicide was when we heard the news stories about Congressman Stupak's loss of his son and the information that he uncovered. Looking back, I have to assume that neither the dermatologist nor the pharmacist knew anything about the link between Accutane and suicide. We are given so much freedom in this country to make choices for ourselves because we have so many checks and balances built into the system to protect the citizens. Sometimes we make those choices blindly. 
that trust has been violated. I'm not sure who's to blame. I don't have those answers. I just know that that trust and faith that I once had has been greatly diminished. Also, in looking back, I wish that I had taken seriously that young investigating officer that investigated Clay's death when he asked me the question back in January, was Clay taking Accutane and did I think that this attributed to his death? Oh, I wish I'd taken him seriously then. Maybe Congressman Stupak's son would be here with us today. Be happy to answer any questions you might have, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, on behalf of uh, the committee, I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to once again express our condolences for the tragedies that you've had to encounter and, and will continue to live with. Let me start with uh, you, Mr. and Mrs. Bauman. Uh, you, you found out after your son was gone that prior to his death that uh, on the internet, there was information that showed that there was depression and possible suicide if they took Accutane. That is correct. So this information was on the internet before this tragedy occurred, but you had never been told that by a pharmacist or a dermatologist or, or the company itself? That's correct. The information that the dermatologist gave me our brochures that are, that are made by LaRoche that are copyrighted in 1996 and in 1997. Now, but the point I want to make is that had you been aware of the problem when it was first put on the Internet, if it had been properly given to you by the company or the pharmacist or the dermatologist, uh, this whole tragedy very well might have been avoided. I agree. How about you, Mr. Jackson? Uh, yes, sir. The same situation. Uh, this was uh, nine, ten months after Clay died before we su even suspected anything, you know, like this. And we saw the news story, went to Congressman Stupak's website, and uh, saw the information that he had. I think what got our attention was, is even though it was nine, ten months later, we heard the little news news story on the 10 o'clock local news and we saw like the last three seconds and my wife and I both uh, reacted because there was something about Accutane, something about suicide, but we didn't catch the whole story. And that was, and that put us back to January when this investigating officer asked us this, you know, at the time we thought it to be absolutely ridiculous. And, and now we hear this story, we find Congressman Stupak's website, we see all this mountain of information that's obviously been available for as much as two years prior to, to uh, Clay's death. And so had you been able to have that information before you, you would have seen the signs and it very well might have avoided there the There would have been absolutely no way that that young man would have ever been on that drug. Because uh, the other thing that we learned was that it, it was a drug of last resort and for the most severe cases of acne. Clay did not have those traits. It, in my opinion, he had no reason to be on this drug. He had a normal 16-year-old face that, that and it, it just did not, it was not the severe case that this drug is licensed to be, be prescribed for. Uh. Mr. Ms. Ms. Callis uh, and Amanda, did uh, had you known uh, what was available prior to Amanda going on Accutane, you probably wouldn't have had her on that, or at least you would have no noticed the signs. I, I think that we possibly would have started it. We didn't know. You don't know until you're on this drug and how you're going to react. But I know, had we had the information. I can only tell you what happened when we walked in the emergency room and my husband looked at the emergency room physician and he said, do you think Accutane could cause this? Because it was the only drug she was taking. And his response was, no, that's an acne drug. So had we known, we would have taken it away from her immediately. But we didn't have that option. And so she continued. Well, it. but the point is the physician at the hospital when you went in had no knowledge whatsoever about the side effects of Accutane, even though it had been reported much earlier and was on the internet. 
I don't know that at that time, because this was back in 1997, it was on the internet. Um, but they had... Uh, apparently it was in the PDR, buried, the possible depression, but uh, we didn't know that. And apparently neither did the physicians. And because had we known any of that, and had it been available to us, we would definitely would have taken her off Accutane. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your testimony. I know how difficult it must be to come before a committee of the Congress and share your, your, your pain, and we certainly want to extend our sympathies to you. I, I think your being here is very important as we explore this issue and, and we learn uh, what we can. You've all said, as I understand it, that if you'd known about this risk, if there was some information about a risk of, of, of suicide versus clearing up some acne, none of you would have put your children at that kind of risk. Is that a fair statement from all of you? And, uh, and you didn't know until very late that there, the problem in the case of the suicides might have been related to, the, to uh, using Accutane. Once you learned, or at any point, did you ever let the company know that you think there was a problem related to the drug, or, or let the, the uh, FDA or your doctor know about uh, it? We notified the FDA. We filled out an adverse event report form mm -hmm. and sent to the FDA. Uh, I found it strange that that was a voluntary reporting system that we were supposed to do, but we're not aware that it's even out there. Mm -hmm. And a dermatologist, for sure, isn't going to be sending in that type of report. And this was how many months after your son's death? This was in, um, is it October or November of this year when we sent the report in? So it'd be. So, so after you, you'd heard about Congressman right, Stupak's exactly. son and you started yes. making this connection, yeah. then you took it upon yourself to let the FDA know. Right. Did you let your doctor know? No, it, you know, it's it's extremely hard to go back in that office and, and I, because of everybody's so scared of getting sued and nobody wants to say anything, so nobody will talk to you. Mm -hmm. And and I don't want to put put that <coughs> attitude out there, but I was interested in knowing what was in Clay's medical file. And I called over there and asked to have a copy of all of his medical records and said, no problem, would you like to come by and pick those up? Yeah, it'd be fine. Mm -hmm. So I went by uh, later that day and, and signed the release and picked up a copy of his file and uh, left. And it was just business as usual. It was no, no, how are you doing or how's, you know, I mean, it was really strange. Uh, and I go back out in the car and I sit in the parking lot and what I could read of his handwriting you know, I mean, there's there's absolutely nothing in that file. It's just the dates of the appointments. As far as uh, you know, the doctor didn't even know about the, the association of uh, Accutane with uh, suicide. No. You know, and, and, and even, and this is a highly respected dermatology clinic in our community. Uh, this isn't some rookie. I mean, this is a, this is a predominant, very well-respected dermatology clinic in our community. And the brochure that we come home with is dated 1994. And uh, Clay, this, you know, when he was put on the drug was in 99, five years later. Mm. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Bauman, I, I, I'm asking the question whether you contacted the doctor or the company or the FDA, n not in any way to be critical, but just to know if, if you did. And uh, if you didn't, I could understand you're not doing it. Uh, what, what would be your answer? I contacted the doctor two days after Dan's death to let him know that Dan had passed away and that we wouldn't be making his next appointment that week. And this was before I even knew the re that there may be a potential link between Accutane and depression and suicide. I don't know if the doctor reported it to the FDA. I can guess he didn't because I would assume that someone would have contacted me. And. Like I said, I do know that five months after Dan's death, the doctor is now not in practice and teaching at Loyola University. Well, Con Congressman Stupak recommended uh, further studies about the links between Accutane and psychiatric disorders, as well as for increasing the information for patients and for families 
to receive that information about those risks, I assume all of you think, at the minimum, we ought to know more about this problem and people ought to be advised about the risk that they never even might have dreamt that they're subjecting their children to. Is that inaccurate? And Ms. Kelly, uh, did you ever uh, contact anybody about uh, your experience with Accutane and, and the relationship you started to think was there? Actually, I did. The next day, the day that I found out, after I found out about the warning, when it first came out from the FDA, I called Roche Pharmaceuticals um, because their number was on there, because I knew it was supposed to request what it said, report it, and I called. And I remember something that the uh, person that I talked to said that just struck me. It's, it's horrible. She said, you know, we've had a lot of calls about those things today. And I thought, my God. And then I said, how many kids have died? And she said, hmm, I don't know. I also talked to them again a couple of months later because they were supposed to call back in 30 days to see how Amanda was. They didn't bother. Um, and as you can understand, I was furious by this time. I have talked to my daughter's uh, doctor, her dermatologist, and I talk frequently now. Uh, I still use that dermatologist. It took a lot to go back. But I trusted that she didn't know, and she didn't know. And since that time, she and I have talked. She always wants to know what I'm doing with it because we talk all the time. I go everywhere I can to tell about this drug. And she has said that in since Amanda's case, she has pulled three patients off of the drug, that she now asks them about how they're doing if they're depressed. But she is the only dermatologist that I know of in our entire area that even bothers to ask. And she only asks because she knows about Amanda. So I don't know that anybody else ever even checks. I mean, who tells the dermatologist that they're depressed? You go to your doctor. You don't go to your dermatologist. I know that Stacy has talked to the pharmacy about it on a couple of occasions. And I think even recently that the pharmacist said that they've done some of their own investigating as well. Well, do we do know Lobby, Mr. We, we do know that even before any of you had your experiences here with uh, Accutane, that the company knew that there was some association with the use of Accutane, and FDA had knowledge about it as well, and in Europe, they were taking stronger action. And my feeling is they're, they're the ones who should be telling you, not you telling them, so that we could avoid these problems. Thank Think you very much. The, the word that I came to my mind when I did find out is I felt bushwhacked. Ms. Morell. Thank you. I want to add my, um, my voice to those who said that we thank you very much for coming and telling your story. Uh, as a parent myself, and I think all of us on this uh, uh, panel are, we can, we can emphasize with what you've been going through as much as one can who hasn't experienced it. It seems to me from what you've said, Accutane has an immediate, almost an immediate reaction. I mean, we're talking about things that have happened within several months. Is that, is that correct? Probably several weeks. Really? Mm -hmm. The and reaction I, from listening to Amanda in the back give a report to a news reporter, it's exactly the same thing that happened with Daniel, too, and I can't remember the question that was asked, but it was so appropriate. And it, it's not, a, there, the reaction is immediate, but it's, con, it's continually worsening. Would I say that's, that's accurate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, since I've been on the drug and I'm the only one on this panel who can state how it feels to be on Accutane, the physical side effects occur very quickly, but... Um, Within, within days of taking Accutane, my mood began to change. Um, within a week, I was crying for absolutely no reason. I think um, one of the easiest examples to tell people is my, my dad bought me a jacket that I wanted. I'd wanted it for a few months. And um, when he gave it to me, I looked at it and um, I burst into tears because he hadn't asked me and I didn't understand why I was so upset. But I was and I couldn't stop crying. Um, so definitely it takes effect very quickly. I mean, within days, my mood had begun to change mm -hmm. along with the physical side effects of the drug. Now, I'm trying to understand the warning statement that is contained within uh, uh, the, the insert with Accutane now, now warns against depression and possible suicide. Is that correct? It does now? It does now, 
But I caution you about one thing of this depression. It is not a normal depression. It doesn't act like you would normally see. And also, if you don't know that, that what teenage depression is, or I mean clinical depression, you have no clue. This doesn't happen in such a way that you wake up one morning, oh, my child is depressed. It happens each, I'm a little more each day until finally you wake up one day about six to seven weeks later, and it's generally about two months into the treatment, seven weeks something's wrong and so it's very very gradual so while it may explain depression or say depression now you know you need an explanation of what someone depression like is. Someone who's on Accutane uh, needs to be watched monitored every day to see whether there are nuances that can be determined from one day to another. Now this warning was not on there though back in what 97? Did it, did it happen like 98? Is that what we're talking about? February the 26th 1998 the warning 1998. came out. And the French did it before we did? In March of 1997, I guess French people were more receptive to depression than Americans. Or, or I hope not, to, but I, it, actually that's what happened at the time. I, I realized that, and I wondered, I thought that if some another country came out with such a warning that the FDA would has requirements that Roche should have immediately told well, them. Since we have FDA has that reputation of making sure that every precaution is taken well before other countries generally. Um, and, and, and I think all of you have said that your doctors really were not aware of the intensity of the consequences of Accutane. Mr. Bowman? I'm not sure if they weren't aware. One of my customers is a physician, and he says that he does not routinely tell everybody all the bad things that can happen as a result of a drug being administered because the instances in many cases are so small of bad things that it's just... Whether it's not worth it or what, I don't know. Sounds but like that. It seems to me like that should be in great big bold print because I've read aspirin bottles which say, you know, uh, all kinds of horrible things could happen as a result of taking, you know, aspirin. more than two aspirin at any one time. And I, I would like to respond to your previous question. I, we did meet our friend who, who was picking up an Accutane prescription for her son, and I asked her to look at the labeling. I even asked her to save it for me, but apparently she didn't think that it was an important thing that I was asking her, so she didn't. But there was nothing on her labeling, and this was just last summer, mm -hmm. this summer. And sometimes even labeling is such small print also. Not only are we accustomed to looking at warnings, but such small print. Uh, again, I, it almost sounds as though doctors, either they, are, they feel that they're worried about uh, the risk of, uh, uh, of being sued or, you know, uh, um, whether that is a problem, liability problem, or whether they just don't know. So it seems like in, in a recommendation that might come from this committee, there should be something with regard to educating doctors too. Do you agree? Definitely I mean, I'm some, trying to figure out what it I is would say we some can do. Physician education and patient, patient, potential patient education. You know, we need to educate the children and the, and the parents. I, yeah, One of the things that I notice about physicians, dermatologists particularly, and what I have heard said over and over from them, and, and you have to understand, I now go and talk, I ask everybody about it. They'll say, well, I've never seen it before. Or they'll say, well, the risk is so minimal that, you know, I've not seen this. It's not something to worry about. I don't think that the dermatologists actually believe that depression is an, a, a possibility. And if they don't see it, and if a child commit suicide, they'll never see them again. And if a child is depressed, the amazing thing about Accutane is you pull them off and they get better. And so once they stop the treatment, well, then they're okay. And so you don't ever see that part of it. So I don't think that they're really aware. Or if they are, they just assume it won't happen to them. I feel that parent education is most important because it's the parents that monitor the children most of the time. The physician only sees them on occasion once a month in the in the, in the parents uh, had i known what amanda here had said earlier it would be very easy to see the signs as a parent may i ask something that i had wanted to see done ever since then because i realized it um if there were some way that every time a child went to the dermatologist right now if they could fill out a little just a little checklist and a parent had to fill that checklist out of certain symptoms 
that would clue you in as to what's going on as a physician. You could take it and do it. I even think that there's one in existence today and uh, that can be done. It's a profile of some sort. Something that lets the parent and the physician know what's going on with you that kid. You mean a profile before the... Well, before every the time that it, you start before, you know, what is your mood? How many hours a night do you sleep? Do you, you have insomnia or something? Something so you have a base to start. And then once they start, if, if every visit that child went to the dermatologist, and I'm saying very selected, not mild to moderate anymore. Okay, so you continue to monitor. You continue the monitoring so that that physician has right in their hands, they can see something going on. But you need the parents to do that because I'm afraid the kids would not sure. necessarily right. tell the truth. They'd right. be afraid they'd be taken off. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, one, one thing that seems to be a tie here is that I heard Mr. Jackson say also in the back was uh, lean people are, seem to be... Low body fat seemed to make a difference. Our son was very thin. He stopped eating. He slept all the time. He didn't want to go to school. He didn't care about his grades. He lost his desire to live, I believe. And he also was very thin at the end and very depressed. He stopped taking care of our dogs, and he had done that all his life. He loved those dogs. It almost seems like there should be a connection between the mental health groups as well as the physical health groups in this particular situation. Maybe we can work something out. I want to thank you very much for you. Thank Did you, you want to make an I believe there are some obvious signs. As a parent now, hearing what I'm hearing today, I think there are some obvious signs that can be can be very easily interpreted, and, mm -hmm. and maybe we can avoid other people. But, and again, the studies that have been you know mentioned, I would think we should move ahead fast with those. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Barella. Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, have been very moved by your studies, and I've known a lot of children that uh, have had Accutane when my own children were going to school. And uh, we, fortunately, we did not have the problems that uh, uh, occurred and that led to death. But uh, the dermatologists that I have known have uh, put it under a very controlled manner of just six weeks or that, and uh, then they haven't given it anymore now. To what extent they have this knowledge, I think, Mr. Chairman, there's a nice list of uh, major associations attached to an article in your test opening testimony, and we ought to send them all the files we've got here and copies uh, so they could understand your daughters and your sons, what happened to them. And uh, I would think that would uh, they ought to be getting increasingly conscious of the effect of this. Uh, and then, obviously, second panel will get into it. But we we got to do it on a human side. And certainly, we could uh, give some of you uh, the package of testimony we've had, and that might sway a few doctors from asking the questions you want them to ask. And they apparently, according to your testimony, do not ask. Uh, but uh, in my opening statement, I said uh, I'd like to know the difference between suicides that have Accutane and suicides that don't and the degree to which that is likely to happen. Now, maybe we'll hear that on panel two. I don't know. But uh, that's certainly a question we ought to ask and try to deal with. And so I thank you and yield back my time. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horn. I want to thank... Uh the witnesses for their testimony. I know it's been very difficult for, for all of you. Uh, let me just say that we uh, on this committee and in the Congress will do everything we can to make sure that uh, the information that you've given us today and your testimony is, is, is disseminated as widely as possible so that uh, parents uh, and uh, children across the country will have as much information as possible so that these tragedies won't occur in the future. And. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being thank with us you. today. Our next panel is Dr. Perizer, Dr. Jacobs, Dr. O'Donnell, Dr. Bull, and Dr. Hune. Did I pronounce that correctly, Hune?
again. Hmm? Why is that? Is this appropriate? Dr. Hewn? Dr. Hewn? Dr. Hewn? Would you would you care to uh, come to the table? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it was the department's understanding that Dr. Hume was coming uh, to accompany the witness and would answer any questions that our witness, Dr. Bull, might not be able to answer for you. I thought that was understanding with the staff. Well, that's fine. Uh, does she prefer not to be at the table? Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman, that is our preference. Okay, well, if we have questions for her, um, I presume she'll come forward at the time. Yes, Mr. Chairman, okay. that's the case. Okay, thank you. Would you stand, though, Ms. Hume, along with the rest of the uh, table? Raise your right hand, please. You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you got? I do. Be seated. Okay, we'll start with uh, Dr. Pariser. Is that, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Thank David Pariser. Yeah, you're a dermatologist, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is David Pariser. I'm a dermatologist in private practice in Norfolk, Virginia. I'm also the Chief of Dermatology and a Professor of Dermatology at the Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, and I'm, I'm on staff in four uh, Norfolk area hospitals. For the last uh, 24 years, I've had the opportunity to treat uh, thousands of patients with uh, acne of varying degrees of severity. And furthermore, I also maintain an active practice in clinical research. Uh, over the last eight years, I've participated in over 150 uh, research projects and clinical trials, including numerous acne clinical trials for a variety of pharmaceutical companies, including three trials funded by Roche Pharmaceuticals. I have in, uh, received indirect funding in the past through the National Institute of Health, but not any from that agency in the past year. Uh, in addition to my daily medical duties, I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the American Academy of Dermatology. And I'm here today on, on behalf of the over 13,000 members of the Academy and millions of patients. And I wish to uh, express my appreciation for your invitation to appear before you and uh, discuss the drug isotretinoin, commonly referred to today as Accutane. My number one concern when treating patients, and that of the academies, is for patient safety. We are committed to ensuring the safe use of this drug. And we're also committed to ensuring that Accutane continues to be available to patients who need it. Like many of my colleagues, I was drawn to the specialty of dermatology for intellectual as well as personal reasons. Uh, as a young man, I personally suffered from severe cystic acne, and today my, my face bears the scars of my battle with this disease. I have a 20-year-old son who suffers from severe cystic acne, and I have prescribed Accutane for him. Uh, he just finished his second five-month course of Accutane at age 20, having taken a previous course when he was 15. Accutane is not simply a cosmetic problem. This is a disease, and in some cases, a very serious skin disorder. It's the most common skin disorder of any age group, affecting 85% of all teenagers, approximately 20 million Americans. Now, acne is a disease of the pilosebaceous unit, the hair follicle, which consists of an oil gland connected to it. And although found all over the body, these pilosebaceous units are, are larger and more numerous on the face, on the scalp, on the upper back, and the chest, the areas where acne is most prevalent. In normal skin, the oily substance called sebum, uh, produced by the sebaceous gland, empties onto the skin surface through the opening of the follicle. And while we do not know exactly what causes acne, we do know that changes in the lining of this hair follicle occur that prevent the sebum from passing through the follicle to the skin surface. In acne, the cells that line the follicle are shed too quickly and clump together, and these clumped cells block the follicle so that the sebum cannot reach the surface of the skin. And then bacteria, which normally and harmlessly live on the skin surface, begin to grow in the follicle, and all of these factors together produce uh, the inflammation. Now, dermatologists will classify the type of acne by the presence of particular types of lesions, and in the written uh, information that I've pr provided for you, there's a detailed description of the different forms of acne lesions. But in addition to these lesions on the skin, acne has a uh, number of psychosocial effects. 
Studies have shown that people with acne suffer, for, suffer from social withdrawal, decreased self-esteem, poor body image, embarrassment, feelings of depression, anger, and also higher rates of unemployment. As a clinician, I often see patients with uh, moderate to severe acne who have difficulty in making eye contact when speaking, and many cannot uh, even bear to look at themselves in the mirror. Many people believe that acne is a result of poor hygiene. Dirt or surface skin oils do not cause acne, and believing this myth can actually make acne worse because vigorous scrubbing and washing can sometimes actually irritate and interfere with topical therapy. Acne is not caused by diet. Extensive uh, scientific studies have not found any meaningful connection between eating things like fried foods and chocolate with acne, although in some individual patients there may appear to be a cause and effect relationship. Acne is not caused by stress, although stress can influence acne and many other medical diseases. Some people feel that acne is improved by sunlight, and some patients do get a temporary drying effect from sun exposure. Uh, but sun exposure uh, should not be recommended as a major treatment for acne since uh, it can lead to the development of skin cancer. Dermatologists have a number of uh, effective acne treatments at their disposal. And after appropriate evaluation, a dermatologist may recommend cleansing agents, uh, over-the-counter medications, uh, topical and systemic drugs uh, to treat acne. And again, in the written information I've just uh, supplied, there's a, a more detailed discussion of some of the treatments. Non-prescription products, uh, such as cleansers, many over-the-counter medications are, are in fact quite effective for mild cases of acne. In advanced cases, however, some of the stronger cleansers can uh, irritate the skin and even further aggravate acne. Prescription products such as benzoyl peroxide, topical treatments, uh, work by destroying bacteria that are associated with acne, and it works uh, well for mild acne if used continuously. Another product topically that's available over the counter without prescription, salicylic acid, does help to correct some of the, normal ab uh, some of the abnormal shedding of skin cells and unclogging the pores. If acne fails to, prescribe, uh, to respond to some of these intermediate uh, treatments, uh, the this is the place for the oral uh, vitamin A derivative known as isotretinoin or Accutane. Now Accutane has proven to be our, our most powerful weapon against recalcitrant cystic acne and has dramatically changed the way dermatologists manage this terrible disease. Despite its tremendous benefits though, this drug is not prescribed casually. Uh, it's a serious medication. Typically, uh, patients with treatment resistant acne are placed on a five-month course of Accutane, and after usually two to three months, most patients will begin to see a dramatic decline in the number of nodules and deep cystic lesions. A few patients, such as my son, may require a second course of uh, treatment at a later time, but generally not more than two courses. Now, before uh, prescribing the drug, I, I counsel patients about the many risks that are associated with Accutane. I instruct them not to take any vitamin supplements containing vitamin A while taking Accutane since there may be some additive toxicity. I tell them to avoid sun exposure. I test their blood to assess liver function if needed and, and always test for the level of the triglycerides, a fatty substance in the blood, which may be elevated in up to 25% of people who take Accutane. Of course, women who are pregnant or who may become pregnant during therapy must never take the drug. There is a, a pregnancy pr program that's developed by the manufacturer of the drug, which I have incorporated into the routine of my office. I speak frankly to all female patients about the devastating birth defects and discuss the importance of using two forms of contraception. And all women of childbearing potential, that is any female old enough to have a menstrual period and not surgically sterilized who is prescribed this drug must have a negative pregnancy test prior to receiving their first dose and should not begin their Accutane until the second or third day of the men menstruation. I'm aware of the warnings on the label contain, uh, the, uh, concerning the changes in mood, depression, and I monitor my patient's behavior. My own personal belief that it is important to be upfront and honest with patients about the mood changes, potential depression, just as objectively as I talk to them about the dryness and chapped lips which they'll get, or about the potential elevation in the triglycerides. I'm aware of, of uh, the reports that have been mentioned already th today about patients who take Accutane, who seem to get mood changes, who go off it, and the mood changes get better, they go back on and, it, and, it, uh, and the mood changes can recur. I have had a, uh, one or two patients myself who have had that. 
Um, I'm also aware of the patients of suicide and uh, patients who have had severe ac uh, acne that have not been prescribed Accutane. Uh, mostly young men who, uh, where the burden of the taunting of their peers was too heavy to bear. Far more commonly, however, far, far more commonly, I have seen the remarkable positive changes in patients' mood and demeanor due to the resolution or significant improvement of their disease. It's as if a great burden has been lifted from these people and their faces and their bodies are cleared of acne. If I have any doubts about the patient, I doubt whether a female will be compliant about using birth control or if a... Uh, if anyone has an underlying a mental health concern or previous history of depression, I may not prescribe this medication, but I would say that there are people who have clinical depression and who are on depressive, antidepressant medications for whom I have prescribed Accutane when given appropriate psychological follow-up. Given the, uh, may, the many benefits of this drug, I'm, I'm concerned about efforts uh, to create a mandatory registry. Mandatory registry may not be the best method to improve uh, patient safety. Uh, regulation cannot and must not be substituted for the frank, personal, and complete discourse inherent in the physician-patient relationship. To this day, it's my understanding that the FDA has mandated only one mandatory uh, physician-patient pharmacy registry system for a drug called thalidomide. And this drug, there have only been 11,000 patients registered over the last two years. Now, Accutane, on the other hand, is prescribed to nearly 500,000 new patients annually, a tremendous high number compared to thalidomide, mostly uh, by practitioners in private practice. And if it were a registry program, it was instituted, the uh, economic burden and administrative burden of this would be tremendous for patients, for physicians, for pharmacists, and let alone for, uh, let alone tre tremendously increase the cost of therapy. Education of all parties, physicians, patients, nursing staff, medical support personnel, pharmacists, is paramount and must be an ongoing enterprise. Efforts to educate patients should be and have been reevaluated and improved, and new knowledge must be incorporated into physician practices. Continuing medical education and nursing education programs are and continue to need to be amended to assure that new information is disseminated to all. This is how it should be, and education and not regulation is how we will further reduce the small number of inadvertent pregnancies and the psychological events that are occurring. Thank you again for allowing the American Academy of Dermatology to appear before you today, and I'll be glad to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Mr. Jacobs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon to other members of the committee. Uh, I'm uh, Douglas Jacobs. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. Uh, I'm also uh, executive director of the National Depression Screening Day, which is a nonprofit organization which does receive several uh, federal grants. Uh, my interest in suicide began, and I, I'm going to be summarizing my statement rather than reading it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my interest in suicide began in 1972 uh, when my first patient who I was caring for hung himself in a hospital only to be saved by another patient. As a young physician, psychiatrist in training, that was an overwhelming experience in me, for me, and obviously for my patient. When I interviewed my patient, he said to me, I've been a bad patient. I thought to myself, no, I've been a bad doctor. That experience has uh, stimulated and uh, propelled my entire career. Uh, I've devoted myself to the understanding of suicide. I've learned a lot. There's still a lot to learn. In that context, um, I've, exam I've treated suicidal patients, I've done research, and I've edited several textbooks. As part of this journey, uh, I've also become very interested in the problem of depression. Depression uh, uh, in the 1980s, uh, with studies from the National Institute of Mental Health, it was determined it was underdiagnosed and undertreated. And since depression is clearly linked to suicide, although not a cause of it per se, it was in that context that I decided to uh, try out a model of a screening for depression. And this might answer some of the questions of Ms. Morella and uh, Mr. Horn. That uh, could we screen for depression like we screen for other medical disorders? And it's been an experiment. I think it's an experiment that has uh, succeeded in the sense that we, we can do it, 
the problem is that there's much more to be done. For example, that of the 20 million Americans who experience depression each year, less than 20% are in active treatment. Uh, so we, we have many Americans, including young people. If we look at young people, of, and there are approximately 20 million 15 to 19 year olds, their prevalence of depression is about 6%, which means about a million young people that age experience depression each year. And out of that group, only 200,000 or so get treatment. Many of them end up in physician's offices, and many of them end up not getting treatment. In order to answer your question, Mr. Horn, about 2,000 of that group goes on to commit suicide each year. And I will explain that the suicides that I've looked at in the Accutane work are, are no different than the suicides that are occurring throughout uh, America. And it is in that context that I have also formed a high school uh, depression screening program and a suicide prevention call, uh, program called SOS, Signs of Suicide, in which we're trying to communicate to young people that it's better to have a mad friend than a dead friend, because it's young people who uh, don't let their families know the suicides occur out of the blue, and we see it, um, we, see, we see a suicide occurring. I was asked by Roach to uh, evaluate the suicide and depression reports in the MedWatch reports. Uh, I've been a consultant to them, but I'm here today at your invitation. Let me say, in order to first understand suicide, to put it in some perspective, uh, demographically. Suicide is the eighth leading cause of death. There are about 30,000 suicides each year. In the young population, ages 15 to 24, it is the third leading cause of death. It, uh, suicide rose dramatically in that age group from 1950 to 1980, where it tripled. Since 1980 to now, that the, it has remained about the third leading cause of death. It is clearly something that, that we have to address. Depression, as I indicated, occurs in about 6% of the population. What we know about suicide is that, it, from a clinical perspective, it occurs with severe depression. The majority are not in mental health treatment. The majority have seen a physician within the last six months. The majority are male. The majority commit suicide on the first attempt. If one looks just at the profiles of the Accutane suicides, just from a demographic standpoint, that is what we see. The majority are male. They're not in treatment. It is their first attempt. If uh, we could show the uh, table one, uh, and I think you all have this, but this is, this is a, a, a graph to illustrate the complexity of suicide. It is a multifactorial event. No one factor causes suicide, and there are, uh, there are uh, 12 or 14 factors. I've put this specific to adolescents, which who do have age-specific stressors of self-esteem and image related to severe acne, academic problems, disciplinary crisis, humiliation. When I was asked by Roche to look at these, uh, the, these spontaneous reports, I said to myself, well, how could Accutane cause suicide? So I, from what I know about suicide, I said, well, does it uh, somehow affect suicidal behavior? Uh, does it cause impulsiveness? Does it affect the neurobiology? And does it cause psychiatric illness? And that's so, so my orientation, since I didn't see how it could relate to any of these other uh, factors. In terms of neurobiology, uh, and, and again, what we know about depression, and again, I'll talk specifically about that, we believe that there's some alteration of the brain messenger chemicals that affect our mood centers. We do not believe that uh, isotretinoin accutane affects the neurotransmitter system, causing some alteration that would lead to a depressive illness. Impulsiveness, again, is related to the neurobiology. There's no evidence that there's any neurobiologic uh, substrate causing impulsiveness. In terms of suicidal behavior, and this really relates to what we see in the spontaneous reports, uh, and there is a, uh, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between suicidal ideation, suicide attempt, and suicide. 
Of the 5 million Americans who have suicidal ideation, less than 30,000 go on to complete suicide. Of this, and out of that group, we believe about 600,000 attempt suicide. In the MedWatch reports, there is categories of suicidal ideation. The, the problem in evaluating those is that suicidal ideation, from a clinical standpoint, is defined as uh, thoughts of suicide accompanied by an intent to die, whereas thoughts of death, which has a prevalence of about 2.6%, thoughts of death has a prevalence of about 28%. So what, what's in the MedWatch re spontaneous reports may or may not be suicidal ideation. The same for suicide attempts. And, and let me just say, and I know it's a, um, it's, it's not a chart that I included, but if one were to simply look at the, um, the, the Accutane serious events that, that I believe are on uh, Congressman Stupak's website, th there are various numbers listed. If one took the prevalence that I'm reporting to you today, the the, uh, the numbers reported in these uh, events are much, much smaller. And for example, there are, there are a total of 155 cases of suicidal ideation. In terms of prevalence, just in terms of the base population, one would anticipate 390,000 cases of suicidal ideation. In terms of hospitalization, there's 475. In terms, again, prevalence, one would anticipate 13,500. Uh, uh, and, and now this gets to psychiatric illness. Psychiatric illness is clearly the number one risk factor for suicide. Yet the majority of Americans, fortunately with psychiatric illness, which is also part of the hope when I'm consulted, that just because you have a psychiatric illness, you are not fated to die by suicide. That of the 20 million Americans, who experience uh, depression, less than 20,000 go on to suicide. But we've heard today descriptions of depression, and I thought I would try to define what we mean and what is depression and what is depressive symptoms. And if we could show the next uh, chart. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association has uh, developed a diagnostic and statistical manual which has uh, criteria for depression that includes, that really states that there has to be physical and uh, uh, social and occupational impairment for a two week period of time with five of these nine symptoms. And what's important here is that, is that there are multiple symptoms, uh, uh, not only uh, emotional symptoms such as depressed mood and loss of interest, but cognitive, the, the way one thinks about oneself, their bodily changes, and then the most serious thoughts of death or suicide. When looking at uh, the issue of the uh, spontaneous reports in terms of depression, um, the, the question is, is this depression or is this the blues or are these just mood changes? In the majority of cases, in my opinion, what we're seeing are mood changes. They do not satisfy criteria for clinical depression. There were some uh, uh, comments made earlier about uh, positive challenges and, and de-challenges. I've looked at all those cases. A again, the majority of those cases, the mood symptoms go away without specific treatment once, quote, the drug is stopped. That would not be the case if this were clinical depression. Clinical depression has a time course of six to nine months. What, what in the values of treatment, specific psychiatric treatment is that improves treatment in one to two months. Um, Excuse me, doctor. Uh, could you summarize uh, relatively yeah. soon? Because yes. we want to make sure uh, we get there. And, and in, ter in terms of then the specific suicide cases, the spontaneous reports, I looked at in terms of gender, the relationship to on off Accutane, the issue of concealment of symptoms, and then the issue of does Accutane exacerbate underlying illness. And it was my conclusion that, that the gender distribution is the same, that, the per, that there, was, uh, and there was a report of temporal association, that uh, some committed suicide on Accutane, some off Accutane, there's no predominance. A, a compelling series of cases are a group of uh, cases, and there are about uh, 10 to 12 of them, who had underlying psychiatric illness. 
They were given Accutane from anywhere from six months to 18 months. They didn't develop any symptoms, no exacerbation of their psychopathology. Anywhere from six to 10 years later, they committed suicide. To me, this is as close to a, a, obviously it's not a study per se, but if one were designing a study, you're saying giving a drug to an at-risk group that causes suicide, this didn't happen. Um, and then if I could just read the last part. Um, you've asked my thoughts uh, on the adequacy of a passive adverse event reporting system in this context. Although I'm not an expert in adverse event reporting mechanism generally, I believe that in this matter the adverse event reporting system has performed its function of providing a signal of a potential issue. In light of the overall incidence of these conditions, the appropriate focus is on the education of prescribers and patients, as well as further study, uh, scientific study and analysis. In conclusion, although the current scientific evidence does not support a causal link between uh, Accutane, depression, and suicide, given the clinical population and dermatology, and in all medicine, in terms of where my, I'm committed in terms of my career, it is still important for health professionals to be aware of psychiatric risk factors. Monitoring patients for depression, depressive symptoms, and suicidal ideation can help identify any patients who may be at risk and improve patient care by facilitating appropriate diagnosis and treatment uh, of patients experiencing clinical depression. It is my understanding that enhancements are being implemented in the communication of psychiatric information to Accutane prescribers and patients. I welcome these efforts, and I believe they will have a beneficial impact on the dermatologic patient population as a whole. Thank you for, your, for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. Dr. O'Donnell. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to share my comments with you regarding an overview of existing research and information linking Accutane, depression, psychosis, and suicide with other drugs like Accutane and other drugs used to treat acne. I'm an assistant professor of pharmacology at the Rush Medical College in Chicago. I'm also a licensed pharmacist and a certified nutritionist. I not, not, do not hold any federal grants, although I have testified as an expert witness in matters against Roche. I'd like to project my one slide and leave it projected for the course of my comments. My review has included the basic pharmacology and toxicology of vitamin A, and if we could focus just on the top three chemical formula there. From the audience, you won't be able to see that, but please take my word that the uh, three molecules of retinol, tretinoin, and isotretinoin are practically identical. There's only an extremely minor change on the far right uh, end aliphatic group uh, between an OH and a COOH. That won't mean anything to you as a layperson, but as a chemist and a pharmacologist, looking at these three chemicals, uh, not knowing anything different, you would predict the same actions, including the same toxicities. This is part of the basic uh, pharmacology and toxicology of vitamin A and retinoids. This was considered as part of the Accutane Clinical Research Database, and it is also referred to in published literature describing hypervitaminosis A, a condition which uh, is caused by too much retinol, too much vitamin A. Now, vitamin A and Retinoids have been used to treat skin conditions for 50 years, and we now have almost 20 years' experience with Accutane, and clearly Accutane is a very effective drug, and I'm certainly not encouraging anyone to uh, remove it from a therapeutic armamentarium to treat severe acne. But I do question uh, if 1.5 million prescriptions are written for 500,000 patients a year, how many of those patients qualify according to the prescribing indications approved by the FDA for severe recalcitrant acne. And I would direct that question to the, the gentleman from the, uh, the Academy of Dermatology because he did not include that information in his remarks. The mechanism of action as to how Accutane improves or cures acne 
for my reading, is unknown. We also don't know why Accutane and vitamin A substances cause psychiatric conditions. And perhaps I'm using the word cause very casually, and, and I should correct myself. Our, clearly, there are associated reports of psychiatric conditions that have been reported for the last 150 years with vitamin A. Polar explorers used to eat anything they'd find on the ice caps, and they ate polar bears, and, and they favored the livers. And some of them became psychotic, and they reported conditions since then, since 1856, of neurotoxicity, toxic psychosis, schizophrenia-like symptoms. And these have been published throughout the literature since that time. Similar toxicities to vitamin A toxicity have been reported in the literature as well as case reports for Accutane. In fact, the investigational brochure for Accutane in 1978 stated, and I quote, adverse reactions seen with the use of orally administered Accutane are essentially those of hypervitaminosis A. So in other words, you expect it. As a pharmacologist, as a chemist, when you're using a drug, you have to look at history and learn from history. We have a long history of psychiatric toxicity associated with vitamin A. It's not surprising that we have similar reports of similar psychiatric toxicity associated with Accutane. The, I, I'm not going to comment on uh, Dr. Jacobs or Roach's analysis. I think he, he made a very uh, succinct and accurate presentation of their data, nor will I comment on the FDA's analysis because they're here to speak for themselves. Um, I would like to mention an, an analysis that was undertaken in Ireland by a, um, a scientist who did a pharmacoepidemiological analysis of psychiatric side effects associated or reported with Accutane and five other drugs, five other oral treatments used to, to treat acne. The other drugs were primarily tetracycline antibiotics, which is a, a common first-line treatment for acne, and also some hormones, which some dermatologists and other physicians use to treat acne. Uh, Dr. Middlecoop's findings were that uh, there were more reports for psychiatric adverse events and suicide worldwide from isotretinoin than from the use of the five other acne therapies combined and her statistics describe a several hundredfold increase in risk of psychiatric side effects with acne. Now, since we don't know the mechanism of action as how acne works, ex excuse me, how Accutane works on acne, we also heard we don't know the mechanism of action of why vitamin A, retinols, and Accutane cause these toxicities. No one questions that they do. Unfortunately, we do now have warnings that say, because of these reports, this may be associated with suicide, suicide ideation, and so forth. The case reports are suggestive of an association. Clearly, we don't have solid scientific information proving the cause, but this is a neurobiological issue. Uh, and sometimes we can't get into the brains to actually um, prove what works. Uh, we heard from Dr. Jacobs that we don't believe that the neurotransmitters are affected, and neurotransmitters certainly are re responsible for depression and other uh, psychoses, excuse me, and, and psychoses. But there is literature that's, that's, that does suggest that uh, retinols are associated with uh, schizophrenia, and retinols are associated with genes that transcribe the neurotransmitters in the brain. I'm going to uh, stop because my time is uh, over uh, with, a, um, with a comment that I'm pleased to hear that an informed consent form will be provided. Uh, I would also state that since historically we know that vitamin A is accepted to cause these toxicities, that instead of saying uh, we need to prove that 
by the Accutane actually does this, I would turn the tables and say, let's prove that it doesn't. And until we do, take precautions and especially warn patients and their families. Because otherwise, they're the ones who, who are, are really the ones who have to monitor it and, and prevent, make a choice whether they want to take that risk. And if they do, then recognize and be able to avoid a tragedy. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Donnell. <coughs> Dr. <coughs> Pardon me, Dr. Bull. I would first like to thank the families for being here. I think the human face uh, that they placed on this is far more compelling than any MedWatch form that I've ever viewed on this, in this area. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm John Cook Bull. I'm Deputy Director of the Office of Drug Evaluation 5 of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research of the Food and Drug Administration. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the committee's concerns regarding the drug Accutane. Helping to ensure the safe and effective use of Accutane has involved difficult scientific and ethical issues for FDA. We have taken our regulatory responsibilities concerning this drug very seriously. FDA approved Accutane in 1982 for use in the treatment of severe recalcitrant cystic acne that is unresponsive to conventional therapy, including antibiotics. Accutane is uniquely effective in treating patients with this disease, but is associated with serious adverse events, including birth defects. For this reason, it continues to be one of FDA's most difficult challenges in the area of post-approval risk management. FDA must constantly balance the public need for access to effective therapies with the risk associated with their use. FDA has been proactive in addressing the issue of risk management. We recognize, however, that FDA is but one of many players that can and must have an impact on the safety of health care in the United States. Because Accutane is the only product that can potentially cure cystic acne, FDA permitted the continued mar marketing of the product in spite of the known risk of birth defects and other serious reactions. FDA has proceeded to periodically reassess the risk-benefit equation. From 1983 through 1990, FDA and the manufacturers stepped up efforts to communicate the significant risk of, to women of childbearing age. The original clinical trials for market approval for Accutane did not contain significant reports of depression or mood disorders. However, in the mid-1980s, due to post-marketing reports of depression, a labeling revision was done to include changes in mood and depression as part of the adverse reaction section. FDA began a re-evaluation of the psychiatric illness reports in 1996 when a physician in the reviewing division noted two cases of suicide in a routine listing of recent adverse events associated with Accutane. Reports such as this do not necessarily mean that the event has any relationship to the drug. Accutane, however, had previously been associated with depression as already noted in the Accutane labeling. Because suicide is the most serious consequence of depression, the FDA Reviewing Division enlisted the help of specialists in the FDA Epidemiology Division to try to determine where the, whether the cases could possibly be related to Accutane use. The divisions undertook a systematic analysis of the published literature, previously reported cases entered into databases, and incoming safety reports. These reports were not numerous relative to the rate of depression and suicide expected to be seen in the population likely to receive Accutane, teens and young adults. Some of the reports, however, included important details that did suggest the possible involvement of Accutane. Therefore, in May 1997, FDA began working with the manufacturer to fully evaluate the data and determine appropriate next steps. In February of 1998, a labeling change moved psychiatric adverse events in the professional labeling to the warning section. While Accutane labeling had previously included depression in the adverse reaction section, it was hoped that the addition of wording that calls attention to possible suicidal behavior would help further ensure that prescribers would take appropriate actions if patients developed mood changes. Even though a causal relationship between Accutane and suicidal behavior had not been scientifically established, this action was thought prudent given the available information. 
In addition, a letter was sent to doctors who might prescribe Accutane, as well as those likely to see patients who develop psychiatric disturbance. FDA also posted a special notice about Accutane on its public website and released a talk paper to the press to further ensure wide attention and dissemination of this warning. There was also an update placed on the FDA consumer website. FDA also instructed the manufacturer to discontinue promotional claims regarding the psychosocial benefits of Accutane treatment for acne. Patient information is intended to remind the patient about important things they discussed about their treatment with their prescriber. It is, not often, it is often not identical to the wording of professional labeling. Prior to the 1998 change in the professional labeling, there were five signs of potentially serious problems listed as bullets for patients, with all capital letter instructions to stop Accutane and call their doctor immediately. All of these bullets, except mood changes, reflected serious adverse events in the warning section of the professional labeling. Thus, when psychiatric problems were moved in 1998 to the warning section of the professional labeling, it was already in the proper list in the patient information. As with other symptoms of possible serious or fatal problems, the patient information on mood changes did not include specific information about the possible outcome, that is suicide instead being followed by the advice to stop the drug and call the doctor immediately due to the possibility of serious consequence. After the 1998 labeling change about psychiatric disorders, FDA embarked on a very comprehensive reassessment of the overall labeling and risk management for Accutane. The revised patient information resulting from this work was implemented on an interim basis with a commitment by the manufacturer to conduct patient comprehension testing and to pursue further revision. The interim revision implemented in the summer of 2000 captures the possible outcome for mood disorder, that is suicide. The need for research to determine if the linkage was causal began soon after the labeling change. The manufacturer undertook multiple epidemiologic studies, Results reported thus far have been inconclusive. Epidemiolo epidemiologic studies by FDA of the de-challenge, re-challenge cases, also analyzed by a Roche study, are suggestive of the critical need for further research. It is very likely that a controlled mass clinical study would not be feasible for ethical and technical reasons. Therefore, an important goal of seeking outside expert advice was to explore other approaches. In September 2000, the Dermatologic and Ophthalmic Drugs Advisory Committee again discussed Accutane. The two major topics were prevention of fetal exposure and risk management strategies for the uncertain risk of psychi psychiatric effects associated with the use of Accutane. On the issue of psychiatric events, the committee unanimously agreed that there was sufficient concern about Accutane to justify exploring additional risk management strategies, even though the risk was uncertain. The committee recommended that the manufacturer add the information about the adverse events to the informed consent document signed by patients and their parents or guardians prior to receipt of Accutane that they develop and distribute an enhanced prescriber educational program about the psychiatric events, that a medication guide be developed and implemented for Accutane. The committee was also asked whether further studies to help clarify the relationship between Accutane use and psychiatric events were needed, and if so, what kinds of studies. The committee discussed the many ethical and technical problems with controlled clinical trials in this instance, and offered ideas for other types of studies with an emphasis on basic science research, particularly focused on the adolescent central nervous system, as well as epidemiologic studies in addition to those already underway. The agency is working with the manufacturer as well as the National Institutes of Health to implement the committee's recommendations. In conclusion, Accutane continues to be one of the more challenging products that FDA regulates. We think the record demonstrates the agency's continued concern regarding this product and our efforts to manage the associated risks. We are hopeful that research will establish whether or not the psychiatric events associated with the use of Accutane are truly caused by the drug. We will continue to work with the manufacturer to keep health professionals and consumers aware of the risks associated with Accutane and the circumstances under which it should be used and prescribed. 
Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this important matter. I presume that Dr. Hewn does not want to make an opening statement. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, we'll probably have a couple of rounds of questions, questions at least as far as I'm concerned. So uh, bear with us. We're going on five-minute rounds, and then uh, we'll come around for a second round for those who want to ask more questions. Dr. Jacobs, uh, are you aware that a month after the Dear Doctor letter was sent out warning doctors about the concern about Accutane being linked to depression, that the FDA sent a warning letter to Roche Laboratories about advertising that made false or misleading statements and promote Accutane for an unapproved use. According to the warning letter, and I quote, Roche's promotional material state or suggest that Accutane is safe and effective in the treatment of what Roche describes as the psycho psychosocial trauma and emotional suffering associated with acne, including negative psychosocial uh, effects such as depression and poor self-image. This claim is particularly troublesome in light of information recently presented in a Dear Doctor letter that Accutane may cause depression, psychosis, and rarely suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, and suicide. As someone who's an expert in suicide, how would you respond to a company promoting a drug which reported suicides for treatment for psychosocial trauma? Uh, well, first of all, I'm well, I'm not aware of any communications between Roche and, and FDA. I mean, you're bringing that to my attention. I have not seen that. Uh, the issue for me uh, as an expert is that um, suicide, depression, can occur in the Accutane-treated population. On the other hand, we know that uh, persons who have severe acne, as was uh, indicated by Dr. Pariser, can have psychiatric symptoms, including depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, the Accutane can be helpful. Clearly, the need to communicate accurate information, I, I certainly support. The, in, in, I was aware of that label change. From a scientific standpoint, I do not see that Accutane causes depression or causes suicide. The issue is, should a physician be aware of mood changes in their patients? Should a physician be aware of suicidal ideation? Part of the project I'm involved in, National Depression Screening Day, and to answer Ms. Morella, we have a primary care outreach. And well, part of what we do is we educate physicians about what the signs and symptoms of depression are and how to uh, ask about suicide. So I think it's important it, it, should it be specific for Accutane, I think it should be uh, for all physicians, including well, dermatologists. Well, you, you, you are not aware. That was the, uh, my question. You were not aware that uh, the FDA wrote a letter to uh, or contacted uh, Roche uh, saying that they were uh, giving uh, uh, questionable information. No, uh, I, I and mean, maybe that's a, it's important to clear up. Well, my, my relationship to Roche, I've served as a consultant specifically from a scientific standpoint, looking at the data in the spontaneous reports, okay. and that's the nature of my okay. consultation. Well, what drugs are you aware of that can cause uh, depression and suicide? Well, um, that's also a very interesting question. In my opinion, there is no one drug out there that causes depression or suicide. In the PDR, and I have researched this, there are about 100 drugs listed that, quote, cause depression. However, that is not a science, in, because it's in the PDR, that is not a scientific study. What, they, what this is, is these are drugs that cause depressive symptoms. Okay. I think it's important, and just the issue of beta blockers, which many people are familiar with, cause lethargy, uh, lack of energy, and, in the, and, and physicians are aware it, quote, can cause uh, depression, but it's not depression per se. It's depressive symptoms, uh -huh. and so there. And none of those drugs are associated with suicide. And, and if you're asking about drug-induced quote depression, it's symptoms of depression that don't satisfy the criteria that I indicated earlier. Uh, but those, there is no study that shows that that type of quote depression is associated with suicide. Well, you're a consultant to Roche. Are you still a consultant with Roche? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. 
Have you done uh, 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 similar reviews of suicide and, and possible drug causal link for any of these drugs you're talking about? Uh, so in, the, in terms of looking at, uh, I've looked at uh, some of the issues of uh, in um, uh, uh, fluoxetine or Prozac. I've, uh, in, in the context of my consultation with, with Roche, I reviewed the entire literature on drug-induced depression, and I mentioned about beta blockers, so I went to, I didn't do the research. But you found no causal link? I found no causal link. Okay, well, that, that answers my question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman. Let me start off with you, Dr. Uh, Pariser. Um, I've heard estimates that as many as 80 percent of patients for whom Accutane is prescribed have only moderate or mild acne, not the severe cystic acne for which Accutane is approved. Uh, this is undoubtedly why Accutane had over $485 million in sales in the United States last year. This overprescribing exposes significantly more people to the very serious uh, and, as we've discussed, unknown risks of Accutane. How much does the Academy believe that Accutane is overprescribed? Uh, and what's your position on what should be done to limit it? Uh, thanks for the question. Well, I, I don't know that we have any systematic information on exactly how much acne may be prescribed, technically speaking, off-label. Uh, Accutane. Accutane, I'm sorry, whether, how much Accutane is prescribed for acne which is not nodular, cystic, recalcitrant, and unresponsive to other therapies. Uh, I, I think that um, it's a clinical dilemma that many of us who treat acne all the time face. I, I will commonly see a patient who has acne which may be recalcitrant, which may be non-responsive to other therapies, but which may not be cystic acne. And yes, uh, I have prescribed acne in those, uh, I have prescribed Accutane in those situations. There's no statistics that I'm do, aware of. Do you believe that there's an overprescribing of Accutane? Well, I'd have to know what, this, what the numbers were first. Accutane is prescribed for many off-label indications. Off-label means not for severe. Means not for problems. nodular cystic, right. For, for acne, which is recalcitrant, which is non-responsive. So, so there can be dermatologists who are prescribing it for acne cases for which the FDA never envisioned this particular drug to be prescribed. I think that's a correct statement, okay. but it's in the context of, of uh, many drugs we prescribe in ways that are not directly labeled. Well, what's the Academy doing to ensure its members are better informed about these risks? Well, every year at our annual meeting, which is attended by uh, last year over 90 percent of our membership, uh, we have seminars on acne, among other many, many other factors. We have uh, various continuing medical education efforts that are, are, are going on, and uh, that were, those are the major efforts of, the, of education that the Academy sponsors. There are other venues in which our members get information. Uh, our earlier witness, uh, Amanda and her mother, testified their dermatologists and other treating physicians did not know about possible relationship between Accutane and depression. Um, how do you explain the ignorance of, of her dermatologists? and other psychiatrists and treating physicians about the relationship. It, it, are they not informed by the Academy? Are they not informed by FDA? Are they not informed by Roche? Well, I think some, all of the above would be applicable. I, I am personally uh, heart saddened by the fact that many of my colleagues seem to be less informed with, uh, in this than they should be. And I have no defense for that. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's something which we all have to work harder to do. Education uh, has got to happen. Dr. Jacobs, I want to begin by asking a few questions about your background. Have you served as an expert witness or been deposed on behalf of defendants in cases involving uh, patient suicides? Uh, yes, I have. And have the defendants been practicing doctors or drug companies like Roche? Uh, the defendants have primarily been um, uh, physicians or health care providers. There have been and very few cases in which I've... I've actually testified on behalf of ph pharmaceutical companies in a medical legal matter. How many cases have you been involved with and what percentage of your income uh, comes from these cases? Uh, I've been doing this work since about 1980 and I've been involved in approximately uh, 300 uh, medical legal matters and uh, in terms of my income approximately 70 percent of my income comes from my consultation in medical legal matters. 
You represented uh, Roche before the FDA when the agency decided in 1998 to strengthen the warning on psychiatric disorders. Isn't that correct? Uh, I, don't, I was asked to serve as a consultant. I, I don't know if I would officially say I represented Roche. I, I was a consultant for them, certainly. For Roche, and then you testified at the FDA, the FDA hearing. That's correct. And do you think the FDA was wrong to strengthen their warning? And do you think the French and the British governments were also wrong to have similar warnings on Accutane? Uh, I certainly don't think they were wrong. Um, from the data I saw, if I were asked, is that accurate? Is that an accurate statement? That Accutane, and I think the label reads, Accutane, and I don't know whether it's may cause or Accutane causes depression, psychosis, and in rare cases, suicide attempts and suicide. As a scientist, I did not see that. From a public health standpoint, to alert uh, patients that to alert families and physicians that the Accutane-treated population are at risk just as other populations are at risk for, for depression and suicide. For, as, as a physician dedicated to uh, uh, informing the public about suicide, uh, you know, I don't think that that's wrong at all. Just, just on this one point, I know my time has expired, but FDA requires Roche to add the following new boldface warning to Accutane's package insert. FDA is still unaware of uh, the new French warning. Warning, psychiatric disorders, Accutane may cause depression, psychosis, and rarely suicide, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, and suicide. Discontinuation of Accutane therapy may be insufficient. Further evaluation may be necessary. Uh, no mechanism of action has been established for these events. And then there's adverse reactions. In the post-marketing period, a number of patients treated with Accutane have reported depression, psychosis, and rarely suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, and suicide. Of the patients reporting depression, some reported that the depression subsided with discontinuation of therapy and recurred with the reinstitution of therapy." End quote. My, my question to you is that with that warning label, were you testifying in support of that warning label, or were you testifying uh, uh, in opposition, and if you were asked your opinion, would you have urged FDA to have that warning label? Uh, I, I wasn't testifying for or against uh, labels. That's not my area. What, my, I was asked to testify on my scientific analysis of the spontaneous reports. Uh, it's up to the FDA to make their conclusions based upon uh, my testimony. As I indicated before, the, because there's not a scientific a rationale for that label. I, I am certainly not in opposition to that label. It is certainly conservative. There are certainly some patients, as we uh, have heard today, who have had unfortunate experiences while on Accutane, and to the degree that physician awareness and family awareness that depression can occur in young people, that suicide can occur, and if this is a way to alert people, I'm all for it. Okay. Thank you. But the one last did was Roche. Uh, advocating this, or were, was Roche uh, just, uh, urging, to your knowledge, uh, that they not go with this label? Uh, I, I'm, I was unaware of, I, that's not the level that I get involved in. I know that there were discussions after my uh, presentation between Roche and the FDA, and then I heard, the only, I only heard the outcome. I was involved in the process. Thank you. I'll wait for another round. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Morello. Ms. Morello. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to ask each of you quickly a question so I can get to all of you. First of all, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Pariser, uh, Pariser, Dr. Pariser, um, you mentioned that it's not prescribed casually. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering, and yet it seems as though there's no system in place to educate parents and families. Um, with your extensive experience in dermatology, do you feel that physicians uh, prescribing Accutane are doing enough to educate parents and families of the uh, possible dangers of the drug? Well, there are many venues and many modalities of education. There's pamphlets, there's consent yeah. forms, there's education. Something and, you it, feel is particularly good? But, but the main responsibility and the main place to educate is when the physician and the patient are together in the treatment room outside with, with all other outside influences outside the closed door. I think it's the physician's responsibility to do that. <clears throat> if the physician chooses to use some of these educational aids to help that, I think that's fine. 
uh, but it is the responsibility of the physician to do that. I, I spend more time in my practice talking to somebody about Accutane than I do, it takes me more, longer to do that than to take off a skin cancer or to do many other uh, other procedural services. Yeah, so, what you, so what you're saying is that it should be done, it is the responsibility of the physician, but you don't have any guarantee it is being done. I mean, That's correct. Was, right, exactly. You also talk about uh, y you would see the symptoms develop, or, or actually let me put it this way, Accutane is prescribed for like a five month period and then maybe it's prescribed again, and yet hearing from our previous panel, they seem to see adverse symptoms almost immediately and certainly within a couple of months, but they even said during the first week. Well, the so clinical is studies... There disconnect? Is there a disconnect there? Um, uh, well, the clinical studies that were done with Accutane that derived the data on if it's, on its efficacy were done with defined courses of 16 to t usually 16 to 20 weeks of treatment, defined period of time, uh, usually once, and sometimes that 16 to 20 week uh, period can be repeated again later uh, if adequate uh, treatment did not occur prior to that, but usually not more than that. Uh, I don't think Accutane should be or is casually prescribed in the situation of, well, let's take a little bit now and a little bit later. I think that's a misuse of the drug. Mm -hmm. yeah. Except I guess what I'm pointing out is that we heard from previous testimony that that is a very long period of time for a course of action because we can, we can uh, detect um, adverse consequences sooner than that. But let, let me go on then to uh, um, Dr. Ball picking up on what Mr. Pariser has said in his testimony. He discusses the difficulties of the creation of a registry, um, a mandatory registry for Accutane and uses thalidomide as an example um, and says that there would be a lot more um, that would be required. I guess is FDA considering a registry of that nature, and do you see um, some similar problems that um, beset the uh, thalidomide registry? Uh, I would add that the thalidomide experience with the registry certainly informs how the registry is approached. There is also another drug, uh, RU486, that does have a patient registry in place. Uh, with regard to Accutane and I think actions that ensure the safe use of the drug, uh, particularly for a potent drug with the risk profile that Accutane has, I think really compels that we uh, investigate other options in terms of the sufficiency of our current risk management structure. And uh, we're working with the manufacturer uh, in terms of, of, of instituting the registry. Mm -hmm. So Maybe that there'll time, be more effective is there a monitoring of the patient. Or something that you could, uh, we uh, are current. The, what we hear from the sponsor uh, at this point in time is, is as early as, as next summer, summer of 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to add as, as well uh, with regard to the med guide uh, and the enhanced informed consent, we expect to have those out by the first of the year, mm -hmm. sometime in, in January of 2001. Mm -hmm. So those have we. Roche has gotten in a draft to the agency. We've responded, and um, we are optimistic that it's in its final uh, stages uh, to be distributed and, and yeah. available to patients. I, I feel that the chairman would probably want to have the committee notified of what's happening in that regard. And then uh, finally, uh, for Dr. Jacobs and Dr. O'Donnell, just, just briefly, if you think the dangers of um, Accutane were made clear to patients and their families, do you think there is a connection that that would lessen the chances of depression and suicide. I mean, has there been any evidence to show that patients who knew about the dangers of the drug were less likely to experience depression or um, attempt suicide? Um, I'm not aware of I, any. I know this is a difficult thing to kind of like say cause and effect at this yeah, point. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, study that has looked at that. Certainly. Uh, making the families aware of uh, signs of depression, signs of suicide, uh, as I indicated before, will, would not only be helpful in the Accutane treated population, but in all, um, in all families in, in, in suicide, that the suicide rate, unfortunately, has remained about the same. Uh, most people are not aware that depression can occur in young people, about 6% that suicides do occur, and what the warning signs are. So education uh, uh, clearly would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Fine. 
I, my time has elapsed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would agree didn't, that. I'm sorry, I didn't give you a chance to no, answer. Okay. Dr. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think your first question was, if you tell them about it, would yeah. it decrease the occurrence? It's not going to decrease it, but as you heard from uh, Amanda, that had they known, they would have recognized the association and stopped it. And that's a basic premise in any drug treatment. That's why it's important to put warnings and package inserts so if it, if it occurs, the doctor could look, can look and say, oh, yes, this is associated. If not, they're not going to make the connection. Uh, and I do believe that uh, that uh, for, for the patient who goes and demands to their mother or father to go to the dermatologist and demand Accutane because they have one pimple, that if they learn about the risk, they're going to re realize that we, maybe we shouldn't take this risk. For those who need it because it's a severe acne or it's, it's maybe not, it's not so severe but it's disturbing to them, they recognize the risk and they can avoid tragedy by by educating their child, uh, and, and and I've heard, I've heard, and I agree, this is not clinical depression according to DSM-4. Maybe it's Accutane depression. We have Accutane, we have an Accutane-induced birth defect which has its own diagnosis. Children t say, I'm, they don't say I'm depressed, they say I feel weird, or they just spend more time in their room. And having raised teenagers, you don't even always know what they're thinking, but if you know that you, that they're put at risk, or they may be at risk. And since we hear from the psychiatrist, they're at risk already because they're in that age group. Do we want to give them another possible risk factors without doing whatever we can to recognize it and avoid the tragedy? Seems like we're looking for a balancing act too. The fact that maybe maybe physicians should not prescribe it if, a, if someone comes in and says, I want it, even though you're saying, it's not prescribed casually. Maybe we do also need a registry. Maybe we want to make sure that um, that the uh, physicians educate the parents and the families and putting that all together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. M Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm curious, uh, what are the major uh, magazines, uh, professional magazines, that dermatologists generally receive and that you receive? Would you say it's five or? 10 or 20, including a small, a smaller five. number specifically related to dermatology. The Academy uh, publishes a journal, the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, which is the, the premier uh, educational journal for the uh, for dermatologists. Uh, this journal routinely uh, carries articles about acne, about uh, Accutane, uh, the guidelines of care, for example, is published in that uh, in, in that journal. Uh, the other major clinical journal is the Archives of Dermatology, which is an AMA publication, one of the AMA specialty uh, journals that are, are read by most dermatologists. And there are probably two or three others uh, that would be that most dermatologists would be familiar with in some way, shape, or form. It's not ten, but it's probably five. Okay, Dr. Jacobs, uh, is, or do you agree with that? Or are there other magazines that would be professionally used by the typical dermatologist? Uh, well, I would really have to defer to Dr. Uh, Pariser on that. I mean, in terms of psychiatry, generally psychiatrists read uh, the professional journals of their particular specialty, but now with, with uh, uh, the, the uh, information explosion on the Internet, certainly uh, reviews are uh, accessible to, to uh, physicians, which actually make the reading of uh, whole journals probably less, but, but uh, particular information is more available to physicians today. Uh, Dr. O'Donnell, would you agree with your two colleagues on? Yes, I would. Uh, all yes, right. I would. Uh, Dr. Bull, do you generally read the kind of journals the professors have noted? Uh, I would. Uh, Dr. O'Connell, who is with me today, would you agree with that? The uh, publications that uh, dermatologists generally read, the archives, the animal. Uh, well, I'm interested in what's the major professional journals for a dermatologist, Yeah, especially board-certified dermatolo dermatologists. The reason I ask that is, uh, aren't there a number of pharmaceutical ads that you find in most of these magazines? I mean, they, the pharma pharmaceutical companies do advertise in magazines, don't they? Yes, they do. And these are professional magazines, and they advertise in that. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. I'm just a country boy that wants to sort of figure out how it works. But uh, have you ever seen a pharmaceutical ad that says, 
we have a problem uh, regarding clinical, clinical depression, suicide, whatever, and maybe you should be careful about this ad. Have you ever seen one of those ads? Uh, I'm not an expert on a advertising at all, and um, I generally don't, don't read the ads. Um, but what I do know is that generally when a, uh, uh, a, a pharmaceutical product is advertised, that the whole package insert is there with both the risks and, and benefits of the medication. Uh, I'm not saying that I read that, uh, but yeah. it's there. Well, that's part of the problem. People are busy, and they've got uh, offices filled with people that they're trying to treat, and generally they treat very well. But I'm just curious when a pharmaceutical company or the academy puts an ad in or at least a warning on a, one of the professional journal pages so they could say, now, you really should be very careful in prescribing this. Well, in the case of, uh, it's my understanding that all advertising of any, whether it's in a journal or whatever venue that any pharmaceutical company undergoes is, is reviewed by FDA, I thought. I know in the, in the case of the Academy, the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, our premier journal, that, that there is medical oversight for all the uh, advertising and non-scientific uh, pages that are in there such that there's nothing, that nothing uh, you know, off the wall gets through. Well, I guess my impression, I looked over the years at maybe 130 uh, medical journals that was in the university library, and they sort of are usually pretty glowing, and uh, flowers are in the ad and all the rest of it. And I just uh, wondered, where, do, where does reality come from if it doesn't come from the profession? Well, <clears throat> the issue of uh, where reality comes from, I think it's a, it is a serious uh, matter that, and when I say I, I don't read those ads, is because I'm aware of the medications. There's no different what's in there than what's in uh, the PDR or what's available. The, the prescribing of medication is a very serious matter, whether it's Accutane or any other medication, that has to be addressed between a physician and the patient, sometimes if it's a minor, with the family. And that's the reality has to come from the physician. I think, uh, you know, medical journals have a responsibility to provide information. The, the issue of uh, economic support, is, a, is that is a reality. But the reality of medicine is that it's a, it's a practice and it's something that has to be taken seriously between the physician and the patient. How many uh, MDs are board certified for dermatology? Uh, I'd have to defer to Doctor. Uh, there are approximately uh, Eight to nine thousand in the United States. I think that's a close get. That's the board certified. Uh, board certified. Yeah, most uh, and ninety-seven percent or so of those uh, are members of the American Academy of Dermatology. So, how many thousand are not certified? And few, few, uh, few. Because the problem comes uh, if they don't go to put in their standing hours or something in order for licensure. Uh, why they're not going to hear it very much, and uh, often they pick nice places to go, and I understand that. Most professions do that, and it's a good way to get people in the door. But I just wonder to what extent are, is there a vigorous effort made by the professional leadership when there's a drug of one sort or the other or a practice of one sort or the other? It seems to me that would be one of the main channels, eyeball to eyeball or send them an email or whatever it is. Well, at the last annual meeting of the American Academy of Dermatology, we had 17,500 registrants. Uh, there were seminars and symposium on acne, as well as on dozens of other topics. But, but Do you think it made an effect? I think every little incremental change helps some. Uh, we have, I don't know that there's a way that we measure uh, the details of that particular kind of, of, of educational effort, but yeah. certainly a lot of effort goes into it. I'm going to have to leave, so may I just ask one sure. more question? Sure, right. Uh, have there ever been major studies of just plain old vitamin A versus Accutane? What is the effect, if any? Does vitamin A have suicidal tendencies or what? Um, <clears throat> I'm not aware of any such study. The, the only, uh, what I'm aware about vitamin A, and that's mostly from reviewing the literature, is that 
it can cause symptoms that we see in depression, such as irritability, anorexia, uh, energy. It does not, from my understanding, cause clinical depression. And in that sense, I have not seen it in any association uh, with suicide. Don't you think it would be uh, worthwhile? Well, why don't you let Mr. O'Donnell answer that? I think he has some information on that, too. Uh, well, no, there have been no studies because old drugs are not studied for, to determine what people already believe about them. And the, the reports that are, that are in the literature that Dr. Referred to, Dr. Jacobs referred to and I referred to earlier describe, uh, describe patients who are psychotic, who have schizophrenic-like symptoms, uh, and suicides have been associated with vitamin A toxicity. The condition of vitamin A toxicity causes a change in the brain chemistry. Uh, the condition that brings vitamin A toxic patients to the hospital is a swelling in the brain. Uh, it's, this isn't, when we talk about mental health, it, we have to convert that to chemical actions in the brain. So there are errors that there is a damaging chemical action in the brain that's been known, and, and I, don't, I don't know that anybody's done large-scale studies in rats, but we certainly wouldn't do that purposely in patients. Um, so I hope that answers your question. No, it's very helpful, well, and uh, with, uh, I assume, some of the pharmacists have to write a dissertation or a thesis of some sort, yeah. and uh, I would think that's something that they ought to really go after. Well, of the, of the vitamins, you know, the first thing in pharmacy or pharmacology 101 is that there, the fat-soluble vitamins are toxic, can be toxic, and vitamin A and vitamin D are, are the major fat-soluble vitamins, and we, we constantly, and especially with people using... Um, vitaminizing themselves and herbalizing themselves, we're seeing more and more toxicity from these products that they go, can go and buy. And of the vitamins, that's where we have the major okay. toxicity. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Let me uh, <clears throat> ask uh, Dr. Pariser, uh, does Roche uh, uh, Laboratories uh, pay for any of your Academy's annual conference? Do they pay any of the fees for that? Uh, Roche, as well as many other pharmaceutical companies, give unrestricted grants to the Academy of Dermatology for various educational and other efforts. Hmm. But they do not sponsor specific academies. No, but I mean so, their money is yeah. being used to help pay for some of these uh, events. That's correct. Hmm. Uh, you know, I've been to conferences all my life. And uh, when you have a large number of people, like 17, 18, 19,000 people, and you have different meetings to inform those people, usually a very small number go to any one meeting because there's so many other things going on at the same time, including extracurricular activities such as golf and tennis and other things like that. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. I, I would I'm sure you do. But let me just go on. There's no way at a conference like that that you could disseminate the kind of information on a wide-scale basis that everybody would be able to understand and digest. One of the things that troubles me about this hearing today is we had people whose children committed suicide or were adversely affected by Accutane, and they had no knowledge whatsoever from their dermatologist or their pharmacist about this. And in fact, the dermatologist didn't know anything about it, even though it had already been publicized. The pharmacist knew nothing about it, even though it had been publicized, so your conference has not really gotten the job done as far as informing dermatologists across the country about the, the possible dangers psychologically or, or suicide uh, of Accutane. What I don't understand is, if you're a member of an organization like that, why can't you just send out a fax to everybody in b big, bold, black letters saying, Accutane can cause severe depression and possibly suicide, as has been said in current warning levels in France and other parts of the world. Why don't you do that? Well, perhaps if, if, you, if uh, our membership hasn't availed itself of the other uh, means of education, perhaps they wouldn't read that either. I mean, you could argue that. But uh, and I, I agree with you that it's not, uh, it, it is an annual meeting where there are many things going on. Uh, it may not be the best way to reach would the masses. It, let me ask you this. Do you think it would offend Roche Laboratories if you sent a, f a fax out to every single one of uh, your dermatologists around the country informing them of the possible dangers? Do you think it might offend them? I don't think it would. You don't? 
You don't think it would endanger the money that you get for these uh, conferences? I don't think it would endanger the money, and even if it, if, if it did, uh, that would not be the mission of our academy to, uh, to yield to those, to those well, kinds of economic Why wouldn't you just pressure. go ahead and send the facts out to all the dermatologists in the country saying, this is a risk, and many dermatologists evidently don't know about it. There was testimony before the Congress of the United States by people who had lost children. They knew nothing about it, even though it had been publicized on the Internet. And so we want to make sure you know about it. Why don't you do that? I'll check into it. Would you do that? Right. And if you don't, do me a favor. Give me a list of all your members, and I'll send the dang on thing out. Okay? We can do because that. I don't want to have other people coming before our committee with their kids being dead because possibly Accutane caused it. Now, let me ask you a question, Dr. O'Donnell. You said that the people who ate polar bear livers in the middle 1880s that were on polar expeditions... Yes, had sir. psychotic events because of the large amounts of vitamin A, the, vitamin A they were consuming in the livers of polar bears. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And was this just an isolated incident, or was this something that happened more than once? Uh, there were there were more than there were several reports. Not many were published, but it was common knowledge, and people had to avoid excessive use. But similar reports through uh, since then have have published. Uh, neurotoxicity, toxic psychosis, but the first report I referred to was the polar expedition in 19, in 1856. So, so vitamin A in large quantities definitely causes the kind of problems you're talking about, and that is what Accutane in, in, in main part is made up of. Yes, sir. You know, uh, Dr. Bull, one of the things that I don't understand is, and I, I won't be able to ask Dr. Huyn, Huyn about this, I guess, but I'd like to know just a little bit about how Accutane was approved and what kind of testing took place at the FDA before it was approved. I understand that this was approved before advisory committees were being utilized, and so Dr. Hewn and others evidently did some of the research on that before it was made, uh, made uh, put into the public domain. Can you tell me what kind of testing was done, and if not, can Dr. Hewn give us that information? Well, I can get it started, and certainly if Dr. Hewn wants to add to uh, my statement, that would be, be certainly suitable. Uh, FDA does not conduct research. We review research conducted by the manufacturers, so all the research that we review was done by Roche Pharmaceuticals. Um, uh, yes, but let me interrupt you. When you, yes. when you, when you review, uh, when your advisory committees today, or whatever it was back in those days, reviews it, they review the scientific data in detail before they give an advisory opinion to the head of the FDA so that it can be approved? Uh, the process begins with review of the protocol uh, for right. the study. And um, once the studies are completed, review of the actual data, how well the study adhered to the standards that were set out for powering the study, the number of patients enrolled in the study, uh, the parameters that were, were to be assessed uh, to determine efficacy, what parameters were studied to assess the safety of the drug, uh, and how well it meets the mark for what it, it asked to have as its proposed indication. Okay, I, I have to yield to, to my colleague, but let me just cut through this and say, mm -hmm. what I want to find out is how extensive was the research and was it thoroughly examined before they put this on the market? Did they have any kind of information about adverse impacts, about depression, about possible suicide? Was any of that looked into before they put this on the market? The typical way that safety is assessed is based on what is reported. There are adverse events that are anticipated that studies, I think, probably bring a higher level of precision uh, in terms of soliciting comments and, and, and direct information from investigators. Then there are others that are, are could be considered at the discretion. And going back to almost over 20 years ago when these studies were conducted, may not have had quite as high a level of stringency applied to them in terms of reporting all things, because you're, there's so much about a new drug that you don't know. And so, in a sense, every uh, event that a patient may experience is sort of in play. Well, I have more questions so, on this. I'll yield to okay. Mr. Waxman right now, but okay. I want to get back to that. Certainly. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This, this drug was approved uh, in 1982. This is now the year 2000. And we've heard more and more about the, the possible link between Accutane and depression and suicide and suicide ideation and all of that. In September of this year, uh, there was an advisory committee meeting 
and FDA found out that as of May of 2000, 37 suicides were associated with Accutane. Is that still the number of suicides associated with Accutane? 37. Yeah. In that ballpark, the, the numbers there, in terms of ones that have been assessed for uh, not having duplicate reports in the database, um, is in that ballpark. Um, I, I have to admit, the latest number I've seen is 41, so there may have been That's some it. additions to the database uh, since September. So there have been more reports of suicides since yes. September. Yes, and, and certainly the publicity attendant to Representative Stupak's um, website and, and the reports on that have, have certainly stimulated more reports. Now, FDA has always stated that MedWatch captures only 1 uh, to 10 percent of actual adverse events. Can we assume that the number of reported suicides only represent a small fraction of the actual cases? It's certainly reasonable. In 1997, a year before FDA required Hoffman LaRoche to place a warning about suicide on its label, French authorities uh, required Roche to add a warning to Accutane about its risk of suicide. And Roche did not inform the FDA of this warning change. And it was not until FDA required Roche to warn of suicide that FDA learned of the French regulatory action. Is this correct? Yes, sir. Was Roche under any legal obligation to tell you of the French regulatory action? And wouldn't this information have been helpful to you in requiring new warnings for Accutane? I'll answer your second question first, which certainly it would have been helpful to have known. Um, the, your first question in terms of whether or not there was a legal responsibility, uh, we have researched that. It was certainly addressed once we uh, learned of the French labeling change. And our regulations are unclear as to um, whether or not labeling changes must be submitted. What the action the agency is taking to address this is that we have a proposed rule that will address these kinds of gaps because certainly that information is quite important. So for the future, you will require this information of the uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer? Yes, sir. Um, you had clear statutory authority for MedGuide in 1997 and 1998 when you were considering changes to Accutane uh, labeling. Uh, why didn't FDA require issuing a med guide with Accutane at that point, warning of birth defects, suicide, and psychiatric disorders? Um, I think part of the decision making at that point had to do with looking at med guide as a forward looking tool, uh, and um, I think initially was anticipated to be put in place for new drugs. Uh, certainly, uh, I think by all criteria, uh, Accutane in terms of serious and significant adverse events fits the criteria and uh, it will certainly be one of, it will be a drug that will have a med guide attached to it. I think it, in, in terms of why it wasn't considered in 97, 98, uh, in terms of, of what our strategies were for implementing uh, the, the rule, um, we, it was considered, I think, certainly the continuing reports have compelled us to say it makes sense to you to, to have a med guide um, attached to this drug. Just for people who may be watching on television, on C-SPAN, what is a med guide? A medication guide is, um, I like to think of it as a plain language tool to convey serious and significant adverse events to patients. Um, what is special and unique about a med guide is that it is required to be given to the patient at the time of dispensing at the pharmacy. Now, a med guide is different than a, a information to the dermatologist, to the professionals, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And when did information go to dermatologists first under direction of FDA about the possible association with uh, Accutane and depression and suicides? Uh, to dermatologist, uh, in February of 1998 was uh, the time of, of uh, that letters were sent out to the Academy of Dermatology members, the family practitioners, and psychiatrists. Has the clinical data about Accutane and psychiatric disorders changed since 1998, and do Roche and FDA know significantly more about the risks of suicide? Uh, I think more work has been done. I think we still, uh, in terms of data that is conclusive, I, we don't know 
con we don't have conclusive findings. Uh, there's certainly been uh, some fairly large epidemiologic studies that have been undertaken, one of which was published in the Archives of Dermatology in October uh, of this year. Uh, and I think certainly there is a need for more work, but the data remains inconclusive. Do we really know more? I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think, I'm, unfortunately, no. I, I guess the question I'd have mm -hmm. to ask you is, if we don't know any much more about this whole problem and the, of association with Accutane and depression and suicide than we did in 1998, why shouldn't the new box label warning, uh, new informed consent form, and new med guide have been made two years ago? Because we don't, I, in terms of tools, and I think the um, one thing that FDA is learning is that our traditional tools for conveying safety information do not work as effectively as we'd like to see them work. And I think as we are learning more, uh, I think in, a, in, a ch in the overall changing paradigm of healthcare, given that uh, we are realizing as well that the, the, the physician as the intermediary to the patient for information, that that linkage is not working as effectively as it used to. Uh, we really are having to look much more critically at what other mechanisms we can engage to make sure that consumers are fully informed about the adverse events of drugs. So this is part of an evolving picture for us and something that we are actively engaged in, in refining and enhancing our abilities to meet this need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll, we'll let you ask more questions if you choose. One of the things that, that, that bothers me is you, 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 the question that was just asked by Mr. Waxman, you, you kind of just, we, we, we aren't geared up to really get that kind of information out to the American people. That's kind of a cop-out, I think, isn't it? I mean, the Food and Drug Administration is supposed to be the person or the group that guarantees the safety and the efficacy of pharmaceuticals and drugs for the people of this country. And if something's going awry, you're saying, oh, it takes so much time to get the information out. I mean, 19,000 dermatologists, you could send letters out tomorrow to all of them in big, bold print to all the pharmacists in the country. You know, send them, uh, put it on the email. You know, there's all kinds of ways to communicate in this age. And I think it's a real cop-out for the FDA to say, oh, we can't do that. The other thing I want to ask you is this. In 1850-something, polar bear livers were causing psyche, uh, uh, psychiatric problems on people that were eating them because of large amounts of vitamin A. Uh, this pharmaceutical expert or pharmacologist? Both. Both? indicated that the brain swells up when you have too much vitamin A in it, which causes severe problems. When the testing was done back in the 1980s before you put Accutane on the market, did anybody check mice brains? Did they give them large amounts or any kind of animals large amounts of vitamin A to check to see if it caused any side effects? Did anybody check that out? Uh Mr. Chairman, what I will, would like to do is for us to look back at the, the farm tox data and get back to you on you that. You came today and weren't prepared to answer this question? Uh, in terms of the specificity of your question in, regarding mice brains, I'm not... Well, any kind of research, rabbits, I don't care, was large amounts of vitamin A ever injected into any laboratory animals in a test to see if it caused any kind of mental problems in the animal, rat, or whatever? I would have to, I think the responsible thing on my part to do would be to go back and, and have well, our, we, pharma, our pharmacologic and toxicologic experts look back at the original database. Dr. Hune, do you know that, if any kind of tests were done that. like that? Well, I'm sure the, uh, the toxicity of vitamin A has been well known for a long time. Um, I'm sure this is a derivative of vitamin A. It's not certain that this why don't you come to the microphone so we can hear you? We will we'll try not to badger you too much. I won't cause you too much problem. Too many. But I think it's really uh, I'm important. I'm not a toxicologist, but um, I'm sure that there have been extensive studies done on the effect of hypervitaminosis A on, the, on animal brains. But well, what, what, when, when, when you approved this, or you made your recommendation, did any of the studies talk about this at all, about the possible toxicity or mental side effects or anything else that might occur because of this? Because we're talking about vitamin A or derivative of vitamin A. Right. Uh, well, uh, I don't remember in detail. It was a long time ago. But uh, I know that extensive animal 
toxicity studies are done prior to even initiating clinical studies in any drug that is uh, planned to be marketed. Well, can you, can you, uh, Dr. Bull, for our record, and I'd like for you to send it to uh, our, my right hand here, sitting on my left, Beth, uh, could you send me any information you have on the studies that were conducted on the uh, Accutane uh, 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 product before it was approved? And also, I'd like to have any information you have on vitamin A. Because it just seems like to me, and I don't know what my colleague here feels, but it seems like to me if, if vitamin A does have these kinds of side effects when given in large amounts, and you're talking about giving children who have acne uh, a vitamin A derivative over a long period of time, that you would think it might have some kind of side effects which should have been mentioned prior to 1997 in France and 1998 here about possible mental or, or, or worse problems from, from large, in, 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 uh, large amounts of that being ingested. I would add that the label does address uh, a condition known as pseudotumor cerebra, which is, a, uh, I think, the brain swelling that you referenced that was known uh, that's related to... Well, that, 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 that may be, but when we hear people whose children have committed suicide or have had adverse uh, events occur because of Accutane and they didn't even know anything about this, were never warned by their dermatologist, were never warned by their pharmacist, they had no knowledge, they went home, started giving their child the pills and, and, and those side effects occur. My gosh, what a mistake, what a tragedy. In any event, we'd like to have that information submitted for the record, and I'd like to have a list, if we don't have it, of all the dermatologists in the country. And if your association won't contact them, then I'll figure out a way to do it myself, and, uh, and the committee will. And, and I think that we ought to put on our email to all pharmacists in the country the, the warning that, uh, that uh, Roche is now putting on their label so that they'll all be aware of it as well. Mr. Mr. Waxman. Yes. Thank you. I'd like to review some chronology about this... Uh, Accutane product. In June 1985, Roche uh, amended the Accutane package insert under adverse rea uh, reactions to state, quote, the following CNS reactions have been reported and may bear no relationship to therapy. Seizures, emotional instability, including depression, dizzy dizziness, nervousness, drowsiness, malaise, weakness, insomnia, lethargy, and paresthesia. That was in 1985. They first mentioned uh, that there may be uh, an adverse reaction, including depression. Now, this was after the drug had already been approved, uh, but it had been approved in 1982. But in May 1988, FDA required stronger warnings and physician mailings on Accutane's risk of birth defects. And FDA uh, also required additional studies, including follow-up patient surveys. An advisory committee of the FDA said that they recommended FDA restrict prescribing Accutane to board-certified dermatologists, but FDA wouldn't go along with that recommendation. And predictably, the American Medical Association and the industry didn't want the prescriptions limited to this board-certified specialty. They want any doctor to be able to prescribe the drug. Then, then it's interesting that in 1997, FDA issued a warning letter to Roche for failing to submit serious adverse event reports in a timely manner. And then Roche said, well, their computer systems are responsible for delays of up to eight years in complying with the law. So you, know, you, you shouldn't be criticized if you're trying to get the information and Roche is not giving it to you. Then finally, in February 25, 1998, 1998, FDA required these warning labels uh, uh, and new bold-faced warnings about Accutane uh, uh, association with uh, uh, suicide and all of that. And that was at a time when FDA was still not informed that the same warning labels had already been put on the year before in France. And Roche never informed the FDA. So it seems like, um, and then I, I gather, Dr. Jacobs, you testified at the hearing when they finally, resu which resulted in these warning labels, but you testified giving some suggestion that maybe uh, it was more complicated than, than the causation or 
a clear relationship. Is that a fair statement? Uh, yes. I'm just trying to uh, and I think, because I think it's important to emphasize, because I think even, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may just state well, something. Let, let, well, just, let me just, because I have some things I want to pursue no. in the few minutes I have. But uh, you, your position was it's a lot more complicated at that time. FDA heard your testimony. Roche, I presume, did not uh, willingly agree. Do you know whether they did, Dr. Bull, to these warning uh, uh, labels in 1998? When you say willing to, well, to make I understand, the label change? At the time, the FDA was telling Roche, you ought to put a warning label. You have to put a warning label about the association of Accutane and psychiatric problems. Roche issued a press release saying there's no proof of causation and that, quote, teenagers are at particular risk for depression, end quote, which would suggest that they were saying to the public, teenagers are often depressed. Teenagers, because of that depression, may commit suicide, in, in effect suggesting it's not related to uh, Accutane. Now, FDA did its job and said, well, the warning labels have to be on this, uh, on this product. When that warning label was put on the product, what was it put on, a patient package insert or on the box? Where would it go? Uh, the warning label in 98 went into the professional labeling. The existing patient label at that point already included uh, in, in, in capital letters changes in mood. Right. So the, the, more, the clearer warning label, identifying the possible association of Accutane with suicide and depression, went to professionals. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. And isn't it fair to say, Dr. Pariser, that most of the Accutane prescribed in this country are, are prescribed by board-certified dermatologists? It's my understanding it's about 85 percent. Okay. Now, it, don't dermatologists as professionals get the information from the FDA about warnings? Sure, they all, they all would have received that letter in 98. So they received the letter in 98. They didn't have to wait for an ad in a in a dermatological publication, they, they got a warning right from FDA to the professionals. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, uh, then the issue that's been raised by my colleagues is, does the, does the Association of Dermatologists try to continue to impress upon dermatologists that this is a real concern? Um, I assume that dermatologists are informed in a number of ways. They get their uh, warnings from the FDA, when they prescribe this drug and when they're contemplating using the drug for their patients. They uh, get uh, publication information from the Association of Derm Derm whatever your association is called. So, uh, American Academy, American of, Academy Dermatology. of Dermatology. I assume the American Academy of Dermatology would put in its publications information about this problem? Yes, sir. And then there are ads, but the ads, of course, are the weakest link because the ads are put in by the manufacturer. But even in an ad put in by the manufacturer, they have to put in all the, the, the warnings uh, that goes into the, uh, as required by FDA, in the fine print of the ad. So the, the issue is, what better, what, are there better ways for, the, for your association to inform dermatologists? They, they get the information, they are professionals, they get it from FDA, they get it from you. At your annual meetings, uh, do you think that there ought to be a greater emphasis on trying to educate dermatologists about this problem? And, Aside from the annual meetings, are there other ways you might try to drive this issue home to dermatologists? At least for the simple reason that, one, they, they ought to be careful not to prescribe the drug unless it's a severe case. And secondly, if they have a patient, they ought, ought to be asking the patient, are you suffering from, do you see any change in your mood? Do you feel weird? Do you, do you feel sad? So to, to follow up to see whether the patient might be experiencing some, some reaction to the drug. Well, I agree with what you're saying. Obviously, the message has to get out. And in the cases we heard testimony from today, in some cases it hasn't. Uh, I, I don't know what the numerator and the denominator is in, the, in, in this equation of how many dermatologists really do get the message and really do it correctly. Uh, all the venues that you uh, described uh, that are, are ways that professionals, such as dermatologists, ed educate themselves. Uh, another venue, uh, which is perhaps not the greatest, but it happens, is education through the pharmaceutical representatives that call on physicians' offices. Now, that's a sales situation. It's not an educational situation, but there is an opportunity there to, uh, to, uh, to
to provide some education as well. Well, it could be, or, or it could be Roche will hand out the press release saying uh, that there's no proof of causation, that teenagers are at a particular risk, uh, there's no root of, of causation, and that teenagers are generally at a risk of depression. Uh, that's true, but the, um, anything that's handed out in, a, in the physician's office has to be approved by the FDA. So if, if they were going to hand that out, the FDA would have had to approve it. And then the chairman raised, it seems to me, the most important point. Let the patients and their families know. Uh, if people, we, we generally assume doctors know, because they're, they're the professionals. They've gone to medical school. If they're a dermatologist, they've gone through specialty uh, training, and they've had to get a board certification, which means they had to show some some skill and proficiency in the in their in their uh, uh, specialization, and we assume they keep up with the information from FDA and the pharmaceutical companies and from your association. But it, it, just in case, shouldn't does anybody disagree that the patients should get this information as well? No, they should, and it should be the patient's choice as to whether they're going to go on Accutane or not, and, and it should be an informed choice. And I, I, you know, I personally never sell, tell a patient, you have to take Accutane. Never. Uh, do you ever tell a patient... Not to take Accutane? No. Do you ever tell a patient that if you take Accutane, there's a, a, an associated risk with depression and suicide, and that you want to recognize that and balance it out with the, the fact that you, the patient may be very uh, down on himself uh, or herself uh, because of the acne, but could, things could be worse. Well, in my own personal practice, I always do that, and I discuss the issue of mood changes, depression, and potential suicide as objectively upfront as I do getting chap lips or elevation of triglycerides and the issue of pregnancy. I personally do. I can't speak for every other dermatologist in the country. Obviously, there's some who, are, who, have, who don't do that, but I think it's important that it be done. I have to tell you, as a, as a father, uh, no longer a teenage boy, but if, if a doctor said to me, by the way, you have a elevated risk of chapped lips, I might not pay so much attention, but if you say there's an elevated risk of suicide, I certainly would want to pay more attention to it. So the question is, do the dermatologists know about it, and, if, and are they telling the patients, and whether they're telling the patients or not, shouldn't the patients know directly from either the company or the FDA? And I guess it's FDA is working on this med alert in order to inform the patients. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to pursue this. Beyond no no problem. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. L let me just uh, say that uh, I don't want to prolong the hearing, uh, but I would like to have as much information on the research on the vitamin A as possible. Uh, and, and also, uh, uh, I, 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 I just cannot fathom how, with all the w methods of communications that are available from the FDA to the doctors and everything else, how, how dermatologists would not be aware of the side effects of Accutane and, and how that would not be conveyed to the patient and the parents of the patient and how all these tragedies could be avoided just through simple communication. Uh, let me just say, while we're talking about uh, Accutane's connection to depression and suicide, I was disturbed to learn that both the FDA and the manufacturer feel that pregnancy prevention program is not working at Optima. Uh, is it true that over 1,900 women have become pregnant while on the drug and that over 1,400 have been terminated through abortion? And I don't understand how that is after 18 years that this program hasn't been fixed so that uh, you don't have that kind of a problem. Is that, is that a case? There's still a large number of women getting pregnant while on Accutane, even though? That data was reviewed at the recent advisory committee, and the data, as you uh, reference, is, is, is generally accurate which has led to uh, the agency's actions to uh, institute the registry that would ensure that women have a negative pregnancy test, too, uh, before starting the drug, and that they only get a month's supply of the drug, that to get another month's supply would have to be confirmed so by a negative pregnancy. That that's that's, that's going to be okay. part of what the registry will entail, because what we've learned is that the system um, that was put in place in the 80s simply is not working. Okay. The Surgeon General initiated a suicide prevention program last year. Uh, his call to action makes no reference under risk factors to drugs that can lead to depression and possibly suicide. What role has the FDA played in development of this program? And have you considered having the Surgeon General do public service annou announcements about this as well? 
I'm, I'm sorry, in terms of the program on the Surgeon General's program on depression? Yeah, have you, have you considered talking to the Surgeon General about uh, uh, doing public service announcements about possible uh, depression and, and possible suicide uh, because of things like this? Uh, I think that's a very intriguing idea. We could certainly get in touch uh, with his office. We haven't considered it, but it, it's certainly a very intriguing idea. So. Okay. Well, we'd like to have the information that we talked about regarding the studies and what kind of research was done. Do any of you have any fi any uh, final comments you'd like to make to the committee before we adjourn? Uh, I guess I have uh, one, Mr. Chairman. That is, it's a very very delicate uh, comment, and, and it has to do with the the issue of uh, okay. the suicides that we've heard about today that they've been caused by Accutane. These suicides are tragic. They occurred in relationship to Accutane. And I think, it, I think there are steps that are being taken to address this issue. I think suicide is, after studying it for nearly 30 years, is one of the more complicated behaviors. We, don't under, we, we only understand that it occurs. We don't have any study that shows that our treatments prevent it, that with all the outbursts of psychopharmacology, the suicide rate has not dropped. We do not stop our efforts. Can one thing prevent suicide with informing a family about the risks of Accutane? I cannot say it. However, is it useful? Obviously the answer is yes. But I think it's important to keep into perspective that not one thing, from my professional opinion, causes suicide. Well, I understand your position, Doctor. You've made that very clear. But with all due respect, we had parents here today who saw dramatic changes in their children when they started using it. They had no reason to believe it had anything to do with Accutane, and yet that was when it started. Two of the three that testified today, two of the three families, the suicide was successful. One, fortunately, was not. And all I can say is that those parents, had they known about the possible side effects, which has not been given to the public uh, until recently, uh, for that information to have been given them in a timely fashion, their children would probably be alive today. At least I believe they think that. Anything else, uh, Henry? Um, the only thing I'd request, Mr. Chairman, if these witnesses would be willing, oh, sure. some of us may want to ask them additional questions in writing and ask them to submit responses for the record in writing. Yes, we, we would request that as a committee, and thank you, Henry, for mentioning that. And we uh, will we'll look forward to your response from the FDA regarding those studies. Thank you very, very much. We may have additional hearings on this, but we really appreciate your cooperation today. We stand adjourned. <laughs>